Welcome, everyone. This is your graphics uh, symposium on rendering 2021. As conference chair of the conference, I all I welcome you all to this year's edition of the conference, together with my co-conference chairs, Gurprit and Pascal. We have been organizing this conference, and you will you will hear much more from them about the. The details of how we organize this conference is here. And we also have with us here in this opening session, Adrien uh, Bousseau and Morgan McGuire as our paper chairs. And again, they will talk a little bit more about the details of uh, the conference. But uh, can we go to the next slide? Um, so this is the opening session for this year's conference. And um, I would love to welcome you to Saarland. Um, when we applied to organize this year's EGSR conference, we uh, wanted to all invite you to this great uh, place here, Saarland, uh, at the west border of Germany, uh, right at the border to France and Luxembourg. And we wanted to have a great conference event at this uh, Völklinger Hütte, this uh, amazing um, cultural heritage, world cultural heritage site um, that you see here on the right. Um, unfortunately, um, as you know, uh, because of the pandemic, we cannot do that. And so, unfortunately, this will be a virtually only conference. Um, besides uh, inviting you all to this great environment, um, we actually wanted to, we applied for doing this year's conference because of a, uh, a quite exciting anniversary. As you might know, um, our first real-time ray tracing papers here from, from my chair at uh, the Saarland University uh, came out in 2001. So this is the 20th anniversary of real-time ray tracing. Um, and um, even though we didn't know it at the time, you might know that um, the team um, around Ingo Wald, uh, Carsten Bentin, and uh, Sven Wob, and, and also others at, uh, at, at Intel just in February this year got the, um, the Technical Achievement Award, the Technical Oscar for um, our joint research work and then the work that they did at, uh, in, in Embry at Intel. So um, there is a lot to celebrate. You also might know there is a lot of ray tracing in graphics hardware uh, today. We started that with NVIDIA in 2018, but it will be essentially in every in, uh, every um, GPU going forward. And, uh, so there's a lot of stuff happening here. And of course, a lot of the stuff we do in this conference here is related to ray tracing. So it would have been a perfect time and are also, I think, a perfect place to celebrate all of this. Um, I guess we will have to um, we'll have to postpone this, and I'm sure we'll find another good opportunity to do that maybe next year, or in some other um, context. Um, so, having said that, um, again, welcome to this year's uh, EGSR conference, and um, with uh, that welcome, I hand over to Gopret and Pascal, who will tell you much more about the organization of the conference and what you uh, will expect uh, during the next couple of days. Again, welcome, and I hope we'll, uh, you enjoy the conference with, with all the great con uh, content that uh, has been organized for this year. But I also hope that we will get a chance to uh, meet each other in person again uh, as soon as possible and uh, actually continue working together um, as we usually do. Uh, with that, uh, enjoy the conference, and I give you in the great hands of Gurpreet and Pascal uh, about the organization. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Philip. Uh, yeah, welcome everyone for to EGSR 2021. Uh, very happy to. Great. <laughs> the virtual event is really making things happen like real, like real time. So that's great. Okay, so we are we are as already. Pascal, sorry, Philip mentioned. So our chairing committee includes all five of us. Elmar, unfortunately, is not here at this point, but yeah, he, he's doing uh, the very important job of uh, uh, handing, uh, of choosing who will be awarded uh, the different awards we will list uh, during the conference. Uh, 
I just want to first of all give my big thanks and all of us like wants to thank our sponsors who have made this conference uh, free for all of us thanks to their generosity we all can enjoy the content of this uh, this uh, this conference without paying any fees even the gold open access fees for all the authors has been waived thanks to their generous contributions to this conference uh, I, I would like to encourage you to give a big round of applause to the to, to all of our sponsors thanks a lot At the same time, I would like to thank uh, Ilian Georgi, who generously offered to sponsor the EGSR web page, which will be our uh, hopefully the standard web page from now on to host all the future EGSR events. And it will also be able to. We are also planning to archive the hopefully the previous EGSR events. So yeah, thanks a lot, Ilian, for doing that. And with, yeah, let's let's give him also a round of applause here. Perfect. Uh, so yeah, with this, I'll move on to Pascal, who will start explaining you how the virtual platform works. Uh, he has spent a lot of time working on this. So yeah, I, I hope uh, you all will enjoy and will benefit from this. And yeah, with this, uh, welcome again. And Pascal, please take over. Yes, hello, everybody, also from my side. Now I see the virtual format is already working quite well with all the nice reactions and everything, so that's good. And as you can see, this event is happening on OEA this time, which we're giving a shot in particular because it allows the audience to engage more also with the speakers. And I will talk shortly about how you can engage with the speakers and each other during this conference. So far, we have an amazing 450, actually by now it's almost or more than 500 registered participants to the conference. Let's see how many of those will actually actively participate. But I already see quite some people both on OEA here and on YouTube as well. So that's cool. And I'm looking forward to talking and hanging out with many of you. Now you can find our program and all the related information on our webpage, egsr.eu, the only domain you need to ever remember again for this conference. And a, another thing I sh should mention quickly is that in case this OEA thing does not work as we will hope it does, we will always have a backup plan and we will go to the proven old Zoom plus OBS streaming thing. But if all goes well, we will never have to touch that. Now, what can you do on OEA? So one thing you can do is participate in the question and answer section. And if you're an audience member, then what you can do there is you can ask your questions also via video chat by clicking on this icon with the question mark bubble. And after you clicked, you will be visible and audible. You can wait for the chair to hand the word over to you. You can ask your question, maybe ask some follow-up question, and then click again on yourself to leave the slot. And of course, you can also ask questions via text chat simply by typing them in this question board. Now, the other thing you can do is, of course, engage with each other. You can head to the social hub room and create some socializing rooms. In these rooms, you can meet with different sized groups of other people, either just hanging out in a video call and talking to them, or you can actually play some fun little browser games with them. And of course, all the rooms that are created will be visible in the bar on the left. And there you can also just hop into other people's rooms and just connect to them. And of course, if you want to have some more private conversation, you can use this little door icon that you will see when you're in the room to close or even lock the door so nobody else can join you. And that's pretty much everything I have to say. Now, of course, one thing I should mention is that this is a big conference, it's virtual, but it's still a big group of people. And of course, it goes beyond without saying that you should be mindful of that, be respectful of each other, and so on and so forth. And with that, I hand over to our paper chairs to tell you more about our wonderful program that we have.
Thank you. So I will uh, just take this opportunity to say a few words about the, the program of this week. Uh, so we have a, a very rich and diverse program. Uh, we received a, a good number of submissions, which gave us uh, a total of 36 talks uh, selected by our International Program Committee. Uh, 14 of those submissions uh, will appear in a special issue of Computer Graphics Forum, and 19 others uh, were selected to only appear in this symposium. And so we regrouped those different talks in 12 sessions, which uh, cover uh, many topics traditional to EGSR, such as Monte Carlo rendering, uh, sampling, material models, but also some emerging topics such as differentiable rendering or neural rendering. And this makes uh, a nice transition to uh, our two keynote speakers. Uh, I would say that they are highly complementary because uh, they will both uh, present their work that relates graphics to uh, neural networks, but from very different perspectives. Uh, John Barron will present his uh, work on neural radiance fields or NERFs, which is kind of a revolution in the way we can capture and render real world objects. And Roland Fleming will present how he uses computer graphics and uh, neural, uh, neural networks to study visual perception, and in particular, the perception of material and shapes, which are at the core of image synthesis. Uh, and so this is uh, just to uh, just a little teaser of what you could see over the week. Uh, I will end with uh, some uh, thanks to all the people uh, which make who makes this uh, event uh, a great event. So first of all, the authors, uh, as I just said, we received a, a good number of submissions of high quality and that makes this program a reality. Uh, the IPC members who did all the work of reviewing those papers, uh, Pascal, Gerprit and Philippe who are taking care of the organization, which we are enjoying now. And uh, last but not least, a, a very big thanks to uh, Stephanie Benke for all the support she provided uh, during the submission and review process. And finally, to all of you, uh, as Pascal was saying, uh, we took a very high number of uh, registrations. Uh, and I hope you will enjoy uh, this week, uh, enjoy the discussions, uh, meet uh, great people, uh, chat about very exciting research. Uh, so thanks for all those applause, and I will uh, let uh, Morgan also say a few words. So Adrian and I would like to acknowledge that uh, this has been you know, a very difficult year for everyone, year and a half for, for everyone around the world. And we really appreciate, um, you know, especially the fact that so many authors were able to still produce papers and we're very sympathetic to those who, you know, for various reasons weren't able to submit this year and, and hope to see them rejoin the community next year. Um, but also the, you know, the reviewers and everyone behind us who has supported us in order to be able to do our work um, during a really difficult time. And so I, I think it's really exceptional, especially at a time when, you know, I, I don't think all nations really uh, were on their best behavior and coming together. It's so reassuring to see the international scientific community uh, still doing the very important work of science and engineering and, and carrying on where we can. For me personally, this was a very challenging year and, and it ended up quite well. Um, but, you know, without both my family and especially uh, all of the work that Adrian did, he, you know, we were co-chairs and I think it was more like a 90%, 10% split. And I'm so grateful to him and, and owe him a conference as a result. Um, so thank you all for being able to come, especially when, you know, the greatest part for me of EGSR and HPG is just being able to be in the same room with all of you in beautiful locations in Europe. And so once again, next year, we'll be doing that again, I hope. But I just wanted to acknowledge and express my appreciation for all of the challenges that people have overcome in order to make this conference uh, as wonderful as I know it's going to be. And I can't wait to see these talks and keynotes. It's a wonderful lineup. So thank you. So now take a short break and then we will back with the first session. Stay tuned.
Hi everyone and welcome to the uh, first session of EGSR. This year our first paper will be about optimized pipe space regularization by Philip Weyer, Mark Droschke, Johannes Hanika, Andrea Veilich and Jerry Vodba. And you're on. My name is Philip Weyer and I will be presenting our technique called optimized pipe space regularization. Let's see what motivated this work in the first place. This pass trace scene features how to sample paths such as directly and indirectly visible caustics. Those type of paths can be extremely challenging to render for a simple pass tracer. To address this kind of problems, increasingly complex algorithms have been designed over the years. Progressive photo mapping, for example, could efficiently sample this type of effects as we can see. However, in production, the need for simple yet general algorithm is still preferred as they often scale better to arbitrary complex scenes. Rendering caustics with a simple pass tracer is a long-standing problem. For example, manifold next event estimation uses so-called manifold walks to sample refractive caustics by ensuring the physical constraints imposed by the geometry. Very recent work from Tissan and colleagues further generalizes the concept to also sample the so-called SDS path in the case of reflected caustics. While it can efficiently handle perfectly specular interactions, caustics due to glossy surfaces and longer pass chains remain an active challenge and is also the focus of our work. While not directly related to the problem of caustics, the path space regularization introduced by Kaplanian and colleagues focuses on singularities in path space that are not sampleable by local sampling strategies. Our approach is similar to theirs, in the sense that we also add roughness to the vertices to ease the sampling of hard paths. This form of regularization is also sometimes referred to as roughening and is the main focus of our technique. Before introducing our regularization technique, let's first look at how a pass tracer would proceed in this hypothetical scene with three flat surfaces. First, a ray is sampled from our sensor, and once we hit a surface that has some type of roughness, we would then typically use multiple important sampling to both sample the light and the BSDF to get a contribution. This process is then repeated at each subsequent sampled vertex until the pass is eventually terminated. In this particular example, we can see that next event estimation will contribute very little energy and the low probability of sampling the light can introduce significant variance in the render. To address this issue, we introduce the notion of accumulated roughness. The ID is sampled. When a pass is traced from the camera, every vertex that is sampled has its PSDF altered with the roughness that was accumulated along the pass. For example, at the first sampled vertex, this will not introduce any change, since the camera is considered to have zero roughness. This also means that the direct lighting is unchanged. However, when we reach the second vertex, we now update the roughness to account for the previous vertex's roughness. Next event estimation is then much easier and will contribute significant energy to our estimate. This same process is then applied to every subsequent vertex in the pass. Let's introduce some notation to describe this more concisely. We will use g to denote the accumulated roughness function. It takes as a parameter all the roughnesses in the pass, which we simply call the pass roughness. The output of the accumulated roughness function is a regularized roughness alpha prime at vertex k minus 1 for a pass of length k. If we suppose the roughness parameter alpha to be between 0 perfectly specular and 1 completely diffuse, we can in this case define g to be the following. Accumulating the roughness in this way, ensures that any pass containing a diffuse vertex followed by one or multiple specular vertices becomes sampleable. Here we can see the result of using that approach on the previous scene, and while it reduces variance a lot, it also introduces significant bias in our render and destroys all the caustics. Definitely, we can do better than those two extremes. And the main idea is actually very simple. Instead of accumulating the whole roughness of the previous vertices, we could also act only accumulate part of it. At the first vertex, nothing changes, but at the second one, the roughening will be slightly decreased, and so will the last one. Note that in this case, next event estimation will still be successful with a good probability while introducing less bias than before. The formula is very similar to the previous one, with an additional parameter that controls how much roughening will be kept along a path. We use gamma to represent this parameter, and we'll further refer to it as the attenuation factor. Note that this formulation also allows for a consistent estimator if gamma is progressively reduced to zero. A proof of this can be found in our paper. The nice property of the attenuation factor is that it actually allows us to model with a single parameter a whole range of new roughening techniques. Setting it to zero will simply reduce to simple pass tracing, 
while setting it to 1 will match the non attenuated roughening introduced before. Between 0 and 1, different level of noise and bias can be observed. So, which one should we choose? To understand the implication of the attenuation factor, we rendered our scene for different sample counts and calculated the mean squared error with respect to a reference. At 1 million samples per pixel, the only error we receive will be due to the bias introduced by the roughening. When decreasing the sample count, we can notice that the attenuation factor that minimizes the mean squared error is also changed. And as we further reduce the sample count, we can see that the optimal attenuation factor also changes. The mean squared error is nothing else than the variance plus the squared bias of our estimate, and we can therefore also analyze the variance in function of the attenuation factor. By doing so, we can also notice that the variance is actually very similar over large intervals, and we could definitely reduce bias without introducing significant variance in the rendered image. For now, the attenuation factor is unique and the only parameter that we can change in our model. We want to introduce more parameters to further reduce both bias and variance at the same time. However, not every pass is hard, and we want a roughening model that focuses only on the complex paths that are hard to sample for a pass tensor. And finally, we have also seen that depending on the number of samples used to render our image, different optimal values exist. This gives us a hint on how to improve our roughening technique, but also shows us that it can depend on many unknown factors that may vary across different scenes. We would like a method that can both minimize the error with respect to a reference scene, but also a roughening technique that can be used across a large variety of scenes without having to tweak all the parameters of our model. And to achieve this, we will use a differentiable renderer to optimize the parameters of our model. Let's see how we can increase the complexity of our model in a way that will still allow us to generalize well to arbitrary scenes. If we go back to our previous equation, we see that the attenuation factor is always global for now and it doesn't change between different types of paths. Instead, we can easily make it depend on the subpaths we sample. At the first vertex, nothing changes, but then, at the second vertex, instead of applying a fixed attenuation factor, we make gamma a function of the constructed subpaths. And this would also be the parameter that the differentiable renderer allows us to optimize. At the third vertex, the optimal choice is maybe to not roughen at all, since an experiment estimation is already quite simple. The final equation is thus very similar to the previous one, except that the attenuation factor is now a function of the pass prefix. To implement our method in practice, we need some way of discretizing the entire pass space. In our case, we only learn accurate attenuation factor for pass up to length 6 and use a simple recursive heuristic for longer pass. More details on how we implement this can be found in the paper. We have our parameters we want to optimize, but we also need an adequate objective function. Our loss is quite simple and is composed of two components, a mean absolute percentage error, which is similar to the mean squared error described before, but has the advantage of being more resistant to outliers and has shown better convergence being in practice. This alone doesn't give us a good control over the target noise we want to achieve, so we opted for another component that directly estimates the variance. The beta parameter is here to control how much variance is tolerated in the image. This part of the loss will kick in as soon as the variance reaches a certain threshold and effectively allows the optimizer to minimize the bias until a certain noise level is reached in the render. Optimizing our parameters using a differentiable renderer is very simple. We start with an initial guess for every attenuation factor, which we call controls how a specific type of pass is roughened, and then run our regularized pass tracer to get an estimate y hat. Then we evaluate our loss function given our estimate and the reference, and use backpropagation to compute the gradients and perform a gradient descent step to update our initial parameters. By repeating this process, we then hopefully reach close to optimal values for our desired parameters. Here we see that what happens when we optimize the attenuation factors for a rather low tolerance to bias. As you can see, the optimizer slowly finds good parameters for the given hyperparameter beta. And if we slightly increase beta, we can learn another set of attenuation factors that increase a bit the bias in the rendered image in exchange for lower variance. Our training set is only composed of seven carefully chosen scenes, but yet can generalize surprisingly well to a large number of scenes with the same set of learned parameters. Let's look at some results. Here we can see a very similar scene to the one from our training set, but that also features refractive and double refractive cost seats, which can be quite problematic. Our first set of optimized parameters achieves very low bias, as we can see by looking at the converged flip error. 
And if we just want a faster and the more aggressive set of parameters, with speed equals 0.05, achieves almost zero variance for equal time. But the blur starts to become noticeable. In this scene, we can see that our technique can easily be applied to more complex materials and geometry, which are quite different from our training set. The second row of insets shows an example where path tracing is already doing a good job, but our roughening can automatically adjust roughening introduced to not introduce significant visible bias. We also compared our technique to the state-of-the-art specular manifold sampling strategy, and we can see that our regularization with a lower beta value achieves an overall, overall lower flip error in the same time. However, it's still less effective at resolving sharp caustics where SMS really excels. On the other hand, if some visible bias is acceptable, the more aggressive set of parameters again results in very low variance in the same time. This can be quite useful when performing iterative work or simply to get a faster preview of some complex light transport. Finally, our technique can easily be used to get with pass guiding techniques to further improve the convergence speed. The reason why is that by finding caustic paths more easily, it also significantly speeds up the learning of guiding distribution. If we let the image converge, we can see a significant improvement in render time, and it only costs us a small visible added bias. So to summarize, OPSR can efficiently trade bias for less variance across many different types of scenes, and we only introduce bias in the path that actually needs it, and keep the rest of the light transport unchanged, thanks to the optimized attenuation factors. We have also seen that it can be used together with other techniques, such as guiding, without interfering with them. Our method can handle longer path chains with arbitrary glossiness, but we might still benefit from techniques such as specular manifold sampling when rendering high-frequency caustics due to perfectly specular materials. In that particular case, the bias introduced by our regularization might not be acceptable. It might be interesting for future work to see if we could somehow progressively reduce the attenuation factor to zero while transitioning to specular manifold sampling as we approach the singularities that are so hard for path tracing. I hope you enjoyed my presentation and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Philip. Oh, you do see the questions? Good. Yeah. So the, the first question is, yeah, how do you calculate the roughness of mixed materials, say 40% diffuse and 60% GGX with alpha equals 0, 1? Yes, yeah, so that's a very good, very good question. Um, I, I think, so actually the solution is not that complicated because we, we can use a, a stochastic approach to it. So basically we can, uh, before sampling the BSTF, um, check uh, what's the weight and do this stochastically based on the materials, even if you have n, n layers. And then since we only need to query the roughness, basically we will use this as an estimate of um, that we will use to to in the end uh, compute our gamma factor or the attenuation factor. So basically, we as long as we have the info of the roughness at a particular vertex, and if we do it stochastically, it also works quite well. OK, I see Wojtek is uh, aiming to ask a question. Do I have to authorize him? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, conference chair, how do I authorize Wojtek? He seems to be wanting to ask a question, but... All right, while we work out... Oh, okay, and he's... He, he just appears there, but he doesn't have a question. Okay, that happens. Uh, while we're waiting for other questions, I have one. You, you're... Hey, I love this idea of accumulating roughness, and it's uh, it's very interesting everything you did with that. Uh, but B, you're only focusing on the material properties. Um, what happens if the geometry, the underlying geometry of the material, interferes with that? Like there are very uh, high frequency folds, or it's uh, high curvature at some point. That also has the effect of enlarging the lobe, right? 
Yeah, exactly. And and that's actually when you're, for example, if you're at grazing angle, you, you would actually have uh, a different roughness that you're in the end, like the perceptual roughness is different. And um, it, there is not really um, anything special we do for this case. And um, we optimize our factors, um, our, for the roughness is used, uh, we use Beckman roughness um, oh. to do the optimization. But once you have uh, for the Beckman roughness, if you have some way of converting it to another type of roughness, or every other type of roughness converting it to Beckman, um, we can then use this as an approximation to, to then query the attenuation factor. And I, I think one, one important thing is that um, the exact roughness is not that important because they end up in those different bins. So I, I couldn't explain all the details on the on how we do the discretization, but Basically, we have different bins for different roughnesses, and this is also following a logarithmic scale so that um, at very, very close to perfectly specular materials, we will have a, um, a higher um, uh, precision and basically have more bins in that region. And once we have this, we can then um, query the attenuation factor for um, a combination of those bins for a specific type of lengths of paths. And um, this really gives you basically, oh, uh, what kind of paths do I have? And then query for this type of path based on the roughness, okay. which is also, yeah. yeah. OK, there's, an, there's another question in the uh, question box, which you probably see. So it says on slide seven, it seems that the sharp caustics from the original image is lost. Can you explain that? Um, slide seven. I don't remember which slide it was. I suppose it's the one at the top of the on the ceiling of the of the corner box. I suppose. At least, <laughs> well, if that's, you see uh... this one, so so you definitely you will lose caustics, um, and that's that's the price you pay for very uh, long caustics, and that's also why we only optimize um, the the pass for lengths of. Uh, length six, and from from there on, we basically use an approximation for longer paths, which will result result automatically in being roughened more usually. Um, at least the optimizer decided to roughen it more in that case. Um, but there is not really so the guarantee that we can make is on what we present the optimizer in our training set, and and that's where we made sure that every scene in the training set. Is, is composed of, of like those building blocks for SDS pass or, or, or simple caustic or even um, double refractive caustic through SSDSS, for example, and different variants of roughness so that we can cover like those really hard cases. And then um, basically the, the rest of the testing is done on, on, a, on a large set of, of random scenes and seeing how it behaves in general. Uh, but that seemed to work very well. Yeah. Okay. I think so. I think we are approaching the uh, end of the question session. I'm not totally sure because I don't know how math works. Uh, there's one extra, one follow-up question by Sebastian Harold, and I encourage you to go discuss it with him after the uh, session. And there's a question, fundamental question by Eugene Deon. Uh, G looks a lot like the convolution of any Greenstein phase functions. How does this work for volumes? I, I was wondering the same actually. Um, yeah, so we don't optimize for volumes and we only do it for interfaces, um, but uh, it could actually be generalized to volumes um, probably quite easily because the same concept applies and so the G, the, the mean cosine that you use, could be a form of roughness in the end. And uh, as long as if you have this information, you can use this in the optimizer to simply use your binning basically doing it on the normalized factor. And maybe that's also to point out our accumulated roughness function is not um, tied to the fact that it has to be Beckman roughness, for example. It just, you have to have some way of mapping to the zero one interval for the specific one we use, but any uh, type, different type that follow some properties um, that, that we explain in the paper, uh, could work and, and would, would do the trick. So I think it could be very well generalized to, to volumes. Excellent. I'm looking forward to it. All right, I think we have to switch to the next paper, 
which is, yeah, let's give a good round of applause to Sebastian, to Philippe. And the next paper is titled Firefly Removal in Monte Carlo Rendering with Adaptative Median of Means. And it's authored by Jérôme Buisine, Samuel Delpool, and Christophe Renault. And I think Jérôme will be giving the presentation. Hello, everyone. I'm Jean Buisine, a PhD student from Music Laboratory in Calais, France. My supervisors are Christophe Renault and Samuel Delpool from IMAP team. And today, I will introduce our work about firefly removal in Monte Carlo rendering using Median of Means. I will first explain what is a firefly problem, then the previous works which tackle this kind of problem are also introduced. In the third part, I will introduce our method and its simplicity, then the results obtained and are compared to other approaches, before I conclude and discuss about perspective works. Pixel with add contribution, obtained during the rendering process, can give an overestimation and hence get pixel value which is far from neighborhood pixels which can lead to a nightly perceptible noise called firefly. And even if we have uh, 100,000 samples using pass tracing, we still have this kind of noise. And uh, when we use uh, bidirectional pass tracing, we tend to remove a large number of this firefly, but some can still be present. And if we go uh, deeper uh, in the explanation, the figure here illustrates uh, sample values obtained during rendering for one channel of a pixel, an eye contribution can be noticed and uh, involve an error when estimating the classical mean. In fact, in the figure B, uh, the classical mean uh, with its eye contribution is far from the expected one, even if we have a large number of samples. And if we remove uh, this outlier, we can obtain a more reliable estimation, which is closer to the expected mean. But the question here, is about how to identify a such contribution and how to manage them. Concerning previous work, there are several uh, denosing post-processing tasks which have been proposed with deep learning techniques, uh, but here we focus our attention on statically based approaches. Uh, the density based uh, outlier rejection proposed by Decro and colleagues use a CAD uh, to store samples with high contribution in order to check later if a new contribution can be rejected using this CAD tree and neighborhood criterion. Uh, Jung and colleague uh, propose to use a more robust estimator and Zier and colleague to not reject but uh, to adapt uh, the contribution of a possible uh, outlier. The two work uh, will be now detailed. Uh, Jung and colleague exploit M estimator by dividing the samples obtained into several buffers where a mean can be computed for each of the buffers. Uh, they then apply the median of the sorted means obtained, uh, and this estimator is known as the median of means and was already introduced in several previous works for its robustness and resistance to outliers. Uh, they also propose a dynamic M criterion for each pixel, where uh, the standard deviation of the current pixel on the overall image is used to compute it. But if we have a chain with a large number of fireflies, such as the, the, the V chain, we can uh, get a very large standard deviation for the world image. The figure A illustrates the heat map of this dynamic choice ranging from 1 to 17, and hence uh, this dynamic criterion does not catch the firefly pixel and uh, the obtained image using uh, a uh, M criterion uh, still is still noisy but has a, a lower noise via the classical mean. And otherwise, um, if we use the classical mon with M sets to 17, we better reduce the noise even if we have an additional cost. Zier and, and colleagues propose to rewrite samples obtained with a theoretical background, but uh, it involves to storing all the samples and we know that is not possible in reality. And they also introduce an approximate version of their method where M buffers are used to stratify the luminous range of the current pixel. The b parameter B is used for setting the interval range of each buffer, and this parameter depends as on S max, the maximum luminance expected, and M, the buffer size. So we can compute easily uh, a B parameter for different M size. And a remark can be made here relatively to the computed wave, uh, which here exports also some neighborhood pixel information for a better robustness. 
Uh, we will now discuss our method based on uh, the median of mint. Uh, Mon seems to be, to be a very great estimator and robust one, but a drawback of this approach is that Mon uh, can underestimate if we compare it to the expected classical means when no outlier are present in uh, in the fi in the in the image. So the here a uh, figure A illustrates such behaviors for several several m value, uh, where Mon always uh, underestimate when uh, no outlier are present. Figure B illustrates how Mon reacts when an outlier is encountered uh, with several M values, where M sets uh, to, to set to five uh, seems uh, not to be also quite impacted by height contribution. Um, so using classical Mon, uh, you will try to obtain a more reliable final estimator. And for that, we introduce the Gini coefficient, which can be computed over the M means obtained and the Gini coefficient is able to detect equality and inequality in an econ econometric context where zero means perfect equality and one perfect inequality. And we, are, we aim to use this, uh, this uh, Gini coefficient over the M means in order to check the presence or not of such outliers. The Gini coefficient applied over samples with no outlier on figure A with several M value give us information about the fact that there is no outlier even if some inequality is detected and hence here some factoring. Otherwise, uh, when outliers are present, Gini coefficient detects it and need a large number of samples to rely for equality again between each M buffers. Uh, with this Gini coefficient, we introduce two new estimators. The first one uh, is based on a binary threshold criterion to choose between classical mean and mon. The second one, which try to export neighborhood uh, means from the median wa current one. And for that, we introduce a new parameter uh, C uh, in order to auto automatically, with the Gini coefficient, tell us uh, the number of means from bonds uh, once sorted we do not take into account uh, in our final estimator. And uh, in, in order to, to test our new estimator, we uh, set a uh, experimental setup uh, with uh, with S2 for these two estimators, where uh, four cents four cents are used, uh, two of them are sensitive to Firefly, the Vich one and the Villa one, uh, where the reference image is computed here using uh, bidirectional pass tracing with uh, 100,000 samples, and the two other bathroom and crown with no Firefly, where references are computing using uh, one million samples with pass tracing. Uh, using reference images, bathroom and vitrine here, uh, with SSM metric score, which is a human visual system-based metric uh, for file detection, we study uh, the conversion of local estimators such as uh, Min, uh, Jung, and colleague, classical Mon, uh, Gmon with binary criterion, and Gmon with dynamic criterion. For the bathroom scene, all the estimator except the classical mon tends to be closer to the expected mean as we have no outlier. Otherwise, uh, when outliers are present and hence firefly, union colleagues' approach tends to not converge correctly but is better than the mean. And a G based binary estimator is also better than the classical mean, but Gmon and uh, classical mon are the two best ones where well, uh, we can in indicate here uh, Gmon has a better convergence rate at the beginning than, than classical Mon. We also propose a visualization result uh, with SSM and LOMSE um, error on the two cents previ previously uh, displayed. Uh, well, Gmon is better than over in many cases, except on some error where where Mon uh, remove noise in a better way, but it's important to note that Gmon stay very close uh, in that case. Uh, we now compare our proposed estimator with Zir and colleagues, uh, one uh, which is a non-local based as uh, as they export uh, neighborhood pixel information uh, in order to better uh, estimate. Uh, and the B parameter here um, for buffer intervals was set automatically depending of M and Smax. Result uh, indicates uh, that zero and all methods is better on which uh, when uh, m equal to 5 with an impressive convergence rate. Uh, 
and if we use a large number of buffers here 25 we can notice that gmon can be comp competitive uh, to the uncollate even if we are only a local uh, estimator and um, and this is due to the fact that the larger m value we get, the more Gini coefficient we learn from equality and inequality inside the clone pixel. We illustrate here a visual, a visually uh, uh, result, uh, and uh, we can see we can see here uh, that uh, the, the Gmon one is uh, can be close to the zero and colleague uh, method, uh, with uh, even if we have a thorough SSM metric score. To conclude, we introduce the Gini coefficient for wandering estimator. Uh, the two proposed estimator in, in terms of local estimator give great results, especially the G-based MON with dynamic criterion C, uh, which seems to be the most interesting criterion. Uh, as it seems to, to well have knowledge of inequality and equality inside the current pixel with a large enough M size. Uh, otherwise, in comparison to non-local estimator, it's still behind and uh, as it does not require any neighborhood pixel information. It's important to note that uh, both Gmon and Zero approaches uh, require also the same additional cost if we want to use it uh, to use them in, into a progressive rendering. And in terms of uh, perspective work, uh, we will focus our work on the study of some uh, mon estimator extensions such as uh, tournament mode. Uh, we also try to, to use uh, neighborhood uh, information such as uh, the, zero, the zero approach, uh, where Gini coefficient or, or mon estimate estimation can be exploited for such purpose. And uh, the G study over sequence of such uh, estimator uh, and animation uh, can uh, can also be studied in order to check if soft, uh, in some factoring effects can be noticed, and then a uh, Gini coefficient can be perhaps used for noise detection or denoising, uh, or at least uh, with a combination with denoising task. Uh, thank you for your attention, and if you have any question, do do not hesitate. Thank you, Jérôme, for this lively presentation. If you have questions to ask, please step up to the microphone. Uh, I've been told there's a slight delay in the YouTube uh, streaming, so we'll get the YouTube questions in a while. In the, uh, in the meantime, I have a question. So the, the uh, real strength of your uh, estimator is that it's a, a purely local estimator that you can yes. treat every pixel independently. And um, sure. The, uh, the zero estimate is uh, better, but it's non-local. Uh, is there a way to get something slightly better by using some slight non-local estimator to extend uh, your own estimator by looking at, say, neighboring pixels? Yeah, yes. Uh, I think we, we can use uh, uh, s some uh, using the Gini coefficient uh, over the neighborhood pixels. We can uh, we can have in indication about uh, how far uh, the crown pixel is uh, between the uh, between the, the neighborhood ones. So uh, perhaps uh, we could again apply uh, Gini coefficient over uh, the Gini coefficient obtained uh, from neighborhood pixel. That would uh, yeah that would work. Um, and your. Your uh, area of future work, you mentioned that at the end, but that was a bit too fast for me. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what are your plans? Uh, we could, uh, we could uh, I think we could uh, use uh, this uh, Virginia coefficient apply on MON uh, for uh, perhaps adaptive sampling, uh, where uh, we can see if uh, current pixel is um, a reliable one and uh, no fair files are inside uh, the sample uh, distribution obtained and uh, we could uh, we could also check uh, if uh, the the gmon estimator the proposed one uh, can 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 be better in, uh, in animation and avoid uh, some uh, factoring effect uh, 
in comparison to to other ones. Uh, and uh, and uh, some some other uh, robust estimator such as uh, MON extensions uh, can be also uh, studied uh, to to check uh, if uh, they are more robust and uh, reliable to the expected mean uh, for such a rendering process. And uh, to, ah, there's a question by Tobias Rittig. How does this perform for lower sample per pixel, like less mm. than 1,000? Yes, uh, that's a good question. Uh, because uh, Median tends to uh, underestimate uh, with only uh, one uh, samples, I think we, we have uh, a great image uh, in terms of uh, visual. Visually, it tends to be great. But uh, per perhaps uh, with a darker, darker effect, uh, as we uh, underestimate the, 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 the uh, in comparison to the classical mean, but uh, it tends to to be great if we have uh, two curve or three samples. Okay. If uh, if there are no further questions, I think we are. Um, holding up on the end time of the session. So we get to, let's thank the speakers again and move on to the next session, I think. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second session of the day on uh, neural rendering. We have three awesome papers that we'll be seeing in this session, and each presentation will be about 12 minutes with a five-minute five, five break in between for questions. So without further ado, let's start with the first talk, which is a collaboration between Adobe Research and INRIA, authored by Georgios Kopanas, Julian Philippe, Thomas Lemkuller, and George Tretakis. Hi, I'm Georgios Kopanas, and in this talk, I will present point-based neural rendering with pair view optimization. This work was done in the Graph Deco team at Inria Sofia Antipolis, and it was a joint effort of Georgios Kopanas, Julian Philippe, Thomas Lame Keller, and George Zretakis. During the last decades, computer graphics have advanced significantly the way a computer generates content. Often, it cannot be distinguished from real images. But even with this advancement, people without extreme technical skills cannot create realistic computer-generated images. These images need expertise during the creation of geometry, textures, and other assets. This is one of the reasons why using data captured from the real world is becoming more and more popular. The easiest way to capture content is from a set of images that were captured in a casual and unconstrained way, similar to the figure on the left. Rendering using only this input has been a long-standing problem in computer graphics, and numerous solutions have been proposed. This is an extremely ill-posed problem, since our input images can constrain the problem enough for an exact solution. On the right, you can see the state-of-the-art results produced by our method, which runs in interactive frame rates. First, let us review the most recent and relevant work in the field. Image-based rendering can be separated into two categories. First, the works that use an explicit scene representation mostly based on multi-view stereo. From those, deep blending uses per-view meshes. This way, it can improve the geometry locally, even this is not a globally correct solution. While stable view synthesis is using the triangular mesh for multi-view stereo and free view synthesis is using its depth maps for point reprojection, similarly to neural point-based graphics. All these methods learn to blend and aggregate input views in one way or the other, but they are stuck with the original scene representation. Recently, methods that allow differentiable point-based rasterization have been proposed from Yifan and colleagues, and we use them to overcome this issue. In the second category is the most recent and very interesting work of neural radiance fields that incorporates an implicit scene representation fully modeled inside an MLP. This work uses a volumetric representation which makes training long and cannot deal well with high frequencies. We believe our method lies somewhere in the middle and allows us to get the best of both worlds. On one hand, we reuse the geometry of multi-view stereo but on the other hand, by providing a fully differentiable pipeline, we allow our scene representation to be refined and augmented while keeping all the inductive bias that we believe is necessary to solve this extremely ill-posed problem. Let's see an overview of our method. To render an overview, we start from a set of input views. We select the best candidates that contain the most information relevant for the view we want to render. Then we use the depth maps that are initialized from the per view message of deep blending and reproject the images as point clouds. Doing that, we get a separate rasterized buffer for each input view. Finally, we feed them through our neural rendering engine to get the final image. Our method provides a differentiable pipeline which allows us to optimize any per view information we want, for example, depth, normal, and colors. In the next iteration, we will have a refined scene representation. Here are the key elements of our method. Selecting the best input camera is critical to allow our method to run in interactive frame rates while keeping good quality. This is a long-standing problem and our solution applies to many other algorithms. Given a specific budget of input cameras that will allow a algorithm to run interactively, we want to select the input cameras that provide the most information. In this example, these two objects, the blue square and circle, project in the overview. 
commonly used algorithms that choose the best candidates either minimize total Euclidean distance and tabular distance or maximize the absolute visibility coverage. In both cases, the resulting selected cameras are missing the circle in this example. Our method selects the optimal set of input cameras, including the camera on the right that observes the blue circle. We do that by first computing low resolution visibility maps for each input view. Then, we have to find the combination of cameras that cover most of the frame. This is a combinatorial K maximum coverage problem, and we use a well studied greedy heuristic that works exceptionally well. Then, we need to rasterize all the input cameras we selected in the novel view. Traditional rasterization is a discontinuous process. The splats along special dimensions are constant, and visibility is resolved as a piecewise constant function, which makes a point either visible or occluded, without any in-between state. A lot of work has been recently done to allow for gradients to flow during rasterization. We used this work and we applied it in our problem by incorporating a Gaussian falloff along the spatial dimensions and alpha blending for the z-buffer. Another critical step for any point cloud rasterization is determining the size and shape of the splats. Elliptical weighted average, or EWA, is a seminal work on that field. It uses the Jacobian of the transformation to define the accurate shape of the splat. In a multi-view setup, the point cloud is sampled as a regular grid in image space. This information is valuable to extend the original EWA to produce accurately shaped splats for our use case. This allows for information during the backward pass to flow in the proper pixels of the input views. We do that by concatenating the input images to 3D point cloud transformation in the original EWA algorithm. Point splatting in this form is the main performance bottleneck of our method. During inference, we approximate this process by splitting the depth range of the scene in layers and doing order independent blending for each one, while alpha blending only the final values. This allows us to achieve 5 frames per second in a modern GPU. Here is an example of a rasterized input view using all the techniques described above. Another key element of our method is resolving the visibility of surfaces from different views, also referred to as depth test in the literature. Initial experiments showed that our neural renderer struggles to learn the depth test without any inductive bias. Here you can see how challenging it is for our neural rendering engine to resolve visibility without any external help. Input views that come from slanted angles might see objects behind what the current view observes. An example is showed in the bottom. In a soft rasterization setup where points are transparent and depth is not easily defined, determining which view is in front of all others is a complex task. The same pixel in the novel view will receive splats of continuous opacity coming from different images the red and the green for the figures at the bottom. To introduce the depth test explicitly, we consider for each ray a probability density function of depth. Then, we compute the probability of a ray for a given view to terminate before all others. We derive an approximate yet analytic solution for this task that can be computed efficiently for each pixel of each view in a GPU. Here, we show the benefits of incorporating this explicit depth test. Our differentiable rasterization setup allows us to refine and augment our scene representation. For image-based rendering, we decided to optimize the following information. First, extending the RGB color image to a 9-channel feature vector allows the model to represent more information per pixel. This provides a great improvement regarding high frequencies and vegetation. Optimizing for depth, normal and uncertainty allows the model to control the position, the shape and the size of the splats. Now that we have all the elements, we need to put them together in our neural rendering engine. We feed its input views color and learned features to a neural encoder to encode its input view to a high dimensional space. Then, the encoded views are pulled together based on their depth test weights. 
Finally, the aggregated features are decoded to produce an overview. To evaluate our method, we used seven scenes provided by previous work. We rendered three viewpoint paths and we did an ablation study for the different elements of our optimization. Finally, we saw a quantitative analysis with leave one out rendering. Overall, our total training time varies from 3 hours to 14 hours based on the scene. Here, we see a scene with 15 input images compared against deep blending. Please appreciate the sharpness of the vegetation and the thin structures of the chair. This is a scene of 31 images compared against stable view synthesis. We manage a more stable result that also deals with over reconstruction better overall. And this is a scene of 27 images compared against Nerf++. We manage to have a very accurate view of the vegetation while it takes significantly less time to train in the same hardware. Here you see an ablation study for the features. For more details regarding the ablation, we kindly refer you to the paper. In leave one out evaluation, we consistently outperform previous work with a big margin. Our framework can easily be extended for various applications. We demonstrate stable views, style transfer and multi-view harmonization. For the style transfer, we allow the pipeline to optimize the colors of the images with a style transfer loss and a photo consistency loss. For the harmonization, we simply multiply the color of the image with an optimized brightness coefficient that controls its total brightness and allows our pipeline to optimize for it during training. To conclude, we showcase that our intuition that there are benefits in both directions of research, recent IBR research is true. On one hand, taking advantage of the rich 3D information of MVS, while, on the other hand, using differentiability to allow the scene representation to change. Based on that, we propose a new fully differentiable point-based pipeline for multi-view content that exhibits state-of-the-art results in image-based rendering and showcase other applications where this pipeline can be useful. Thank you for listening. Wow, thank you, Georgios, for a fantastic presentation. And I must say, I'm very impressed with the results in Ponch. I, I worked on that scene before, and I never got it to be quite that sharp. Um, I see we already have a, a question from the audience, so I guess we can start with that one. Right. Can you talk more about ablations? I'm not familiar with that term. By right. That, yes. Yeah, by, um, by ablations, we mean uh, we are introducing a lot of new things in our method, right? So, by ablations, what we want to, to explain and show is how each one of those elements of our method are influencing the final results to give more intuition to the reader and more understanding on uh, which of these elements play a big or small role um, in the final uh, renderings. And in the paper, you can see uh, a very detailed study uh, regarding that. Um, and to give you a hint, uh, most of the games regarding especially crisp vegetation uh, is coming from uh, the features, the six the extra features that augment uh, the RGB colors in the interviews. Uh, but to not go really deep on that, because the question is not really asking that, I will refer anyone that's more interested in this work to read the paper regarding the um, ablations. We might get some questions from YouTube as well, but there's a slight delay, so we, we can wait for them. In the meantime, I have a question. Um, it seems like the ultimate dream, at least in my mind, is to take this point splatting approach and optimize it from scratch, given almost no input. Um, and I was wondering how sensitive is, uh, is the, the optimization loop to initialization? Um, and what would the challenges be to go to essentially just SFM as the initialization? Right. I, I would uh, totally agree uh, with uh, the way you phrased it, and that would be the total dream. And uh, it is exactly that uh, what we strived uh, in that project. 
but uh, it is very interesting uh, that uh, optimizing depth, especially uh, regarding geometry, because we actually initialize the, the only initialization we do is regarding geometry. Right? We take the depth maps and the normal maps to be able to control uh, the point splatting uh, during this optimization process. And optimizing depth by making it bigger or smaller um, is actually moving points along the epipolar line. And uh, this, is, um, this is not something favorable uh, during gradient descent because uh, this movement of geometry from one place to the other um, doesn't have nice properties and uh, allows the, uh, the optimization to get stuck in, in local minima. And that is why it is very important for this algorithm to be initialized uh, with that properly and actually cannot recover uh, from big errors um, regarding geometry. But the fact that we allow for depth and normals and uncertainty to be optimized gives another level of freedom uh, in our pipeline to fix some reconstruction errors combined uh, with the neural rendering. Uh, in, to conclude, I would say that I totally agree with your goal, and we really want to get inspired by other methods like NERF, uh, where they are they, they they don't actually move geometry, but they allow geometry to be created and destroyed in 3D space out of thin air. Wonderful. Um, we're slowly running out of time to answer questions, but let's let's try to burn through at least one more from the audience. Um, Lupritz uh, sent a, a question, presumably from YouTube, which is, NERF uses mainly images as input. What other information is given to the network that get improvements? Uh, right. So uh, our algorithm also starts only from input images, right? We don't, we don't need any other information from the real world. We don't get uh, some kind of depth out of the real world. We just use these images and pass them through a multi structure, uh, structure for motion pipeline to actually obtain uh, the initializations for the depth modes. So uh, in practice, both algorithms are using exactly the same input. Although the second part of the, the question that's talking about uh, what is given to the input uh, as an input to, to the network, we are actually providing more information to the network than just images. And this uh, is these augmented features, these high dimensional features that are optimized uh, during training, which extend uh, the three RGB color channel to a nine uh, feature vector, mm -hmm. nine, nine sum feature vector. All right. And with that, I guess we're out of time. Uh, Thank let's you very uh, much. Georgios again for fantastic work and a great presentation. Thank you. Let's um, now move on to the second presentation of the session, which is DoNERF towards real-time rendering of compact neural radiance fields using depth oracle networks. And this is a collaboration between uh, Graz University of Technology and Facebook Reality Labs uh, by Thomas Neff, Pascal Stadelbauer, Matthias Pargar, Andreas Kurz, Jörg Müller, Chakravati Ala Chantania, Anton Kaplanian, and Markus Steinberger. And Thomas Neff will be presenting this, this session. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my presentation on depth oracle neural radiance fields, or DUNERFs in short. My name is Thomas Neff from Graz University of Technology, and we're going to dive right into the motivation for our research. Modern CGI content requires billions of triangles and expansive shading to represent modern photorealistic content. And this trend doesn't seem to stop anytime soon, with modern techniques such as Lumen and Nanite in Unreal Engine 5 that are pushing the boundaries of modern computer graphics. Imagining a setup where some computation or novel view generation is done on a less powerful machine, it's easy to see that this is not a trivial task. To tackle this issue, various different ways of scene representations have been proposed in the past. One major category is that of multiplane images, or MPIs. MPIs try to construct a layered image representation based on a reference pose. These layers can then be efficiently blended during runtime, enabling fast performance even on very weak machines. Local light field fusion generates local MPIs for each pose in the dataset and then blends them together during runtime. 
Next learns neural basis functions that can then be stored in APIs, again for blending during runtime. These approaches typically require a lot of memory for their representation, and quality can suffer when views deviate too far from the reference view. Recently, with the introduction of neural radiance fields or NERFs, implicit neural representations gained significant amounts of popularity due to their simplicity and high quality outputs. NERFs simply generate samples along each view ray, positionally encodes them onto sine cosine basis, and feeds those samples into two MLPs. Additionally, afterwards, the final color can be generated via traditional ray accumulation. This leads to very high quality outputs while being extremely compact due to only requiring two MLPs. However, due to the large amount of samples that are required for each view ray, training and inference times are prohibitively slow for real-time applications. To improve on the performance aspect of NERF, recent work has combined the elegant MLP-based approach of NERF with explicit data structures to improve efficiency. Neurosparse voxel fields construct a hierarchical voxel grid, which can then be efficiently used for empty space skipping to improve both the quality and efficiency of NERF. However, many of these hybrid approaches again trade memory for performance and quality, such as the recent baking and caching approaches. This brings up the question, is there a way to efficiently match the quality of NERF without consuming additional memory? As we will see later, there is. We managed to achieve the same memory efficiency and quality as NERF while substantially bridging the gap towards real-time rendering. So how did we do that? First, let's propose a simple experiment. Previous NERF-style neural representations typically sampled densely between the near and far planes. If we focus just on generated content, ground truth depth is readily available and otherwise can be approximated. If we then simply place samples around the ground truth depth, we can save up to 32 times the number of samples without losing quality. However, this comes at a catch. Depth is usually not available during runtime, and using explicit structures or densely pre-computed depth maps would again require additional memory. This is where our Depth Oracle Neural Radiance field, or DoNERF, comes in. DoNERF is a five-stage pipeline that includes only two MLPs and no additional storage requirements. The goal of DoNERF is to only perform expensive shading network computations at local surface regions, where they contribute the most. The first step of DoNERF is the input of the pipeline. We take RGBD input images that are sampled from a view cell. A view cell is a box with an orientation and scale that describes the orientation and position of the training poses. This streamlines the potential streaming setup where multiple view cells can be blended together, but this does not limit the generality of DoNERF. We take advantage of the view cells by unifying all view rays, such that identical rays map to the same origin on the sphere surrounding the view cell. This makes the learning task of the following networks easier. Our initial experiments have shown that a good compromise for a wide variety of scenes is to consider the space between the near and far planes logarithmically. This intuitively spaces samples further apart as the depth increases, but is not as aggressive as the 1 over x spacing of normalized device coordinates. Our first MLP, the Sampling Oracle Network, operates in this logarithmic space, and its goal is to predict suitable sample locations for the subsequent local shading network in the pipeline. In order to only require a single inference pass through this network, we concatenate all logarithmic sample locations into an n-dimensional vector. During initial experiments, we found out that formulating the sampling oracle network as a classification network produces the best results. To this extent, we discretize the space along the ray into cells and task the network to predict the likelihood of surfaces being in those cells. From the ground truth depth of a single view ray and its neighboring rays, we filter both across image space and depth to generate a filtered classification target for a sampling oracle network. We can then train the oracle network via binary cross entropy loss and predict an n-dimensional classified depth estimate, which we can then use to place samples for shading. Effectively, the sampling oracle network compresses visibility information for each ray into a single MLP. The output of the Oracle network can then be sampled in the same way as NERF does. 
After generating those samples, however, we do not directly go into positional encoding. Instead, we perform an additional space warping step to better match the positional encoding frequencies for large-scale scenes. We do this by warping all samples towards the view cell. Our intuition for this comes from the fact that real cameras and techniques such as MIP mapping also show similar behavior. We can prevent high frequency artifacts in the background and better reconstruct fine details in the foreground. While this does bend the rays, samples from different viewpoints that end up at the same 3D location are still evaluated equally. After space warping and positional encoding, we're finally ready to evaluate the local shading network. The local shading network is a simple 8-layer MLP that predicts color and opacity outputs for each sample, and we use the standard NERF-style ray accumulation to predict the final image. In practice, with as few as 4 samples per ray, the full DoNERF pipeline matches NERF's quality for both large and small scenes. To evaluate DoNERF, we generated six synthetic datasets with 300 images each. We split them into 70%, 10% and 20% ratios for training, validation and testing. For all datasets, we have the ground truth depth available and they were path traced using Blender. We compare against the previously mentioned methods of NERF, NEX, Neurosparse voxel fields and local light field fusion. We configure DoNERF to use 4 and 16 samples per ray. Further experiments with different sample counts can be found in the paper. Finally, to also showcase a version of DoNERF that does not require ground truth depth, we also train a DoNERF NoGT variant. This variant is trained on depth maps that are extracted from a dense nerve and therefore doesn't use any ground truth depth information. Looking at qualitative results, DoNERF is the closest method compared to the ground truth across a variety of scenes. NERF, when sampled uniformly, performs relatively well in smaller scenes such as Bulldozer or Barbershop, but fails in a large-scale forest scene. While this improves when sampling NERF in NDC or logarithmically, it still performs worse than do NERF on large-scale scenes. Neural sparse voxel fields also represent smaller scenes well, but struggles in large scenes due to its explicit voxel structure resolution. LLFF shows artifacts around the detailed edges in Bulldozer and Barbershop, but captures the large scale of forest very well. Finally, Nexus MPI representation struggles in forest and would likely require a more dense, differently spaced MPI for this scene to perform well. To showcase that DoNERF is also robust in terms of temporal artifacts, here are some example videos of DoNERF using 4 samples per pixel. Overall, DoNERF only shows minor temporal artifacts on surfaces that are only very sparsely represented in a training set and provides the best quality overall. We additionally evaluate all methods in terms of memory, performance and quality. In terms of memory, the MLP-based approaches, such as NERF, DoNERF and Neurosparse voxel fields, achieve the smallest memory footprint. While Neurosparse voxel fields also includes an explicit voxel structure, this can also be tuned to be more memory efficient and we have chosen a variant that provides a good trade-off between storage, quality and performance. Local light field fusion and NEX require much more memory due to their MPI representation. Looking at performance in megaflops per pixel, we can see that MPI-based approaches perform the best, as they only require very simple blending operations. If performance on very low power devices is required, these methods can be an attractive solution. Across all methods that use neural network inference during runtime, DoNERF achieves the best results in terms of performance by far, improving over standard NERF by more than 48 times. Finally, DoNERF beats all approaches in terms of quality when averaged across scenes. Therefore, if an extensible, compact scene representation is desired, DoNERF shows the best trade-off across all methods. While DoNERF is robust and works well in most scenarios, there are still some open questions for the future. First, partially transparent surfaces or mirrors can pose an issue if the ground truth depth only provides the first hit surface. NERF handles mirrors such as in the barbershop scene without issues as it constructs a virtual room behind the mirror. In comparison, DoNERF is not able to do this if the reference depth only contains the first hit surface. However, when trained on extracted NERF depth maps, our DoNERF NoGT variant is able to represent the mirror at much lower sample counts. The second limitation is that we only evaluated static scenes, 
so dynamic scenes and objects are still open research. Finally, when training without ground truth depth, the quality of do nerf is slightly lower compared to having reference depth available. To conclude, do nerf is a compact neural scene representation that is capable of rendering in real time while only requiring memory for two MLPs. Here you can see a video of a prototype real time implementation of do nerf using TensorRT and CUDA. At two samples per array, this demo can render an 800 by 800 image at just shy of 20 frames per second. And with that, thank you all for listening to this talk, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for an amazing talk, Thomas. Uh, this, this method is really really inspiring. It seems like we already have a question from the audience, so let's let's kick off with that. The depth oracle network uses 6D coordinates, right? Then I would expect worse temporal stability than the results shown in the slide. Could you elaborate more on how temporal stability is achieved? Uh, sure. Uh, so the depth oracle network, it uses positions and directions as input, although the direction is just one part of the vector. And it, it also has uh, 128 additional positions based on the depth samples along the array. Uh, we didn't explicitly tune it for temporal stability. We do have an additional loss term that forces the opacity of the accumulated ray to be larger than one at least. Uh, that might help a bit in terms of temporal coherence, but other than that, we didn't explicitly constrain it in some way. So I guess what, what helps here is the filtering that we do on our depth targets, because that already captures like quite a lot of uncertainty in terms of the disocclusions that could potentially happen around depth discontinuities. Cool. I, I have so many questions, but I'll try to be, be brief. I have one fun one. How large is one of the meshes and the textures that you train do nerf on, and how how would you how many do nerf networks could you use in GPU memory for the cost of one mesh, roughly? Have you ever done that experiment? Uh, not really. So I haven't or we haven't actually looked at the sizes of the scenes. Those were basically just freely available Blender scenes. Uh, some of them do have very detailed texture work. Um, the do nerf uh, network itself is is pretty memory efficient and even doing tr during training as you don't have to use so many samples you can keep quite a large network potentially even in memory um, so I, I guess there's some some advantage in that too but we didn't run any explicit experiments there cool uh, next question from the audience thanks for the great presentation impressive work plus one. Could you please talk about which other depth estimation methods you could use or tried other than using depths from a pre-trained NERF? Um, so for the for the experiments without ground truth depth, um, to be to be honest, we actually just only did the experiment on the pre-trained uh, NERF. Um, but recently, there have been a ton of papers that also advance like the depth estimation or geometric reconstruction quality of NERF. So I think I would probably start there. You could also take one of the new um, SDF estimation papers that try to reconstruct uh, a signed distance function and go from there. Um, basically, the, the Oracle network is is also a very general concept. You couldn't you just you don't just have to use it in terms of depth estimation. It could also provide you different kinds of things. But we only tried the the depth maps from NERF so far. Got it. One more question. How does the method fare for real captured scenes? Uh, we only have very limited experimental data here. And uh, my intuition currently is that it largely depends on uh, the ability to extract NERF depth maps. So as many of you probably are aware, NERF tends to cheat quite a lot in terms of getting specular highlights correct and stuff like that. And this also reflects on the depth maps that you can extract. So if you have real world scenes where the depth map is not very accurate, it might suffer a bit more. And it also obviously depends on the uh, pose construct or pose reconstruction that you have. If you have fully accurate poses and fully calibrated cameras, it probably works a bit better compared to not having those and having to estimate that. Cool. Um, a real quick question from me that combines both of these. If you could design your favorite real-world capture camera system, would that include a depth sensor or would you stick to normal cameras? 
Oh, I think having a depth sensor is definitely helpful. And I think as much auxiliary or, or basically prior information that you have, you can probably make use of that. And as we have seen in the talk before, like pro potentially not having to reconstruct proxy geometry or something, if you have a sensor that is reliable enough, I would definitely prefer that. Cool. Well, with that, we're out of time. Let's uh, thank Thomas again for a great talk. And now we can move on to the last presentation of the session, which is a collaboration between ATH Zurich, NVIDIA, and Disney Research uh, by Henrik Batz, uh, Jonathan Granskog, Marios Papas, Fabrice Roussel, and Jan Novak. And uh, I believe Henrik will be presenting. Hi, I'm Henrik Batz, and in this video, I'll be presenting NerveTex or Neural Reflectance Field Textures, a new neural primitive for mesoscale appearances. We are interested in capturing and rendering mesoscale materials, which have repetitive geometric patterns like fur and carpet fibers, and vegetation like grass, ivy, or moss. Further examples are also foliage and pebbles, but also fine granular media such as sand and snow, or even skin could be of interest as well. Traditionally, polygons are used to represent vegetation and curves are used for fur. These offer a highly parametric way to model appearances. Surface textures can also be used to vary the appearance locally. These representations are however prone to aliasing artifacts. Volumetric approaches, on the other hand, avoid aliasing artifacts by pre-filtering them at various scales and interpolating scales during rendering. While they can, in the case of repeating mesoscale appearance, be instanced over a surface similar to polygons and curves, they are not well suited to parametric modeling. Which primitive and what rendering and acquisition methods are used in practice highly depends on the specific material to capture. Next to these tried and true representations that are used in production today, there has recently been a large influx of research on neural scene representations and rendering. For our approach of special interest are neural radiance fields, which were introduced by Ben Mildenhall and others in early 2020. The principle is simple and builds on volumetric rendering, more specifically ray marching. A multi-layer perceptron predicts density and outgoing radiance, given a point and direction within the volume. Using these values, the radiance arriving at the camera can then be integrated along camera rays. A nerve is trained simply from a set of images and their poses, with the loss being computed between the dataset and the predicted images. With this approach, nerves allow one to capture the appearance of a scene, including complex multiple scattering effects just from images, no matter the scene content. This makes nerves a great contender to model different kinds of mesoscale appearances. While the original architecture had the lighting baked into the representation, there are now quite a few new approaches that decouple it from the scene to predict reflectance fields instead. Additionally, Baron et al. have shown that it's possible to add continuous LOD support to nerves, enabling aliasing-free results. What is missing compared to traditional primitives, however, and curves in particular, is the ability for artistic control. We'll show how this can be added to some extent while keeping the advantages that this neural representation comes with. To recap, while polygon meshes and curves offer great artistic control, they are also susceptible to aliasing artifacts. Volumes readily come with LOD handling, but can't continuously represent many different appearance parameters. Additionally, capturing and rendering different mesoscale appearances requires different, potentially highly case-specific methods. Neural radiance fields, on the other hand, allow to capture appearance just from a set of images and their poses and can be trained to produce aliasing-free results. So far, however, they do not deliver artistic control in a way that traditional primitives do. Having now presented the problem this work tries to tackle and the approaches we are building upon, we will now look at how we can overcome the shortcomings of neural radiance fields by instancing them on a surface similar to traditional representations we've introduced before. We'll take a look at a selection of examples on the way and discuss them in the end. Since mesoscale appearance deals with highly repetitive structure, we do not need to represent an entire scene with a neural radiance field, but can instead focus on a small patch only. This is not unlike the approach Nere took in 1998 to instantiate and render fur and vegetation using small volumetric primitives. That is, given a mesh, we can instantiate this patch, the nerve texture, many times over its surface at a set of predefined anchor points. 
This allows us to cover an arbitrary object with a specific mesoscale appearance without having to retrain the network underlying the nerf if we want to cover another object. Here is an example of this in action. We instantiate a patch that combines two layers of both long orange and short purple fibers on a cloth match. Since our instancing approach applies a rigid transformation to each patch to place them in the scene, we need to be able to individually adapt it to a global lighting configuration. To this end, we take the MLP underlying nerf, shown here in the middle at the bottom, and condition it to changes in the light direction omega L under assumption of parallel lighting per patch which is reasonable if the patch is small and somewhat far away from the light source. Thus, the MLP now represents a reflectance instead of a radiance field. That is, at each point of the patch, we represent the amount of light that is scattered over the entire patch, including multiple scattering, from light incoming at direction omega L in the direction omega towards the camera. Making use of this, we can also handle changing scene lighting as can be seen here. This also allows our method to integrate well with classical primitives and rendering methods, shown here by the combination of our nerf texture modeling the grass combined with a tri-mesh modeling the football. Next to conditioning the MLP on the light direction, we also train the network with a set of varying parameters denoted beta, controlling the overall appearance of the patch, which allows us to temporally and locally change that appearance during rendering. The example here shows a change in curliness of the fibers resulting in a rougher look. This takes things another step further, with the MLP now representing a whole space of reflectance fields. Compared to a nerf that just represents a static patch, that is, just a radiance field, we lose some amount of detail in the representation by increasing the parameter space. But since we only represent a patch that usually covers just a small part of a rendered image, we gladly trade off this detail for an increase of the space of appearances covered by a single patch. We can make use of this increased parameter space by changing the length of the orange fibers over time. Taking a look at the cloth with fully retracted orange fibers, we can clearly see one of the drawbacks of our method. Since the patches only approximate the surface curvature linearly, in regions with high curvature the delineation of the patches becomes visible. Another drawback of the approach we chose to place the patches on the mesh is that multiple patches can overlap. If a sample point during ray marching lies within two patches, we'll have to choose one to compute the point's transformation to patch local space. Choosing the nearest patch, which is shown on the left, yields the hard cuts at the boundary visible in the previous example, while choosing the patch at random leads to a significant amount of noise. Having now covered the instantiation and underlying network architecture of the nerf text primitive, what remains to do is to define how we accumulate radiance along camera rays. Given a set of bounding boxes corresponding to the patches distributed on the base surface, we intersect a camera ray with them. We then ray march the segments of that ray that lie within a bounding box and fully ignore the segments that lie outside as they yield no contribution of radiance. For each sample point along the ray, we transform the point's global location and light direction to patch local space using the transformation we used to place the patch on the base surface. Note that even though the light direction for each training image is constant, that doesn't have to be the case during rendering time. This enables us to approximate non-parallel illumination, in this example, a point light. Additionally, for each sample point, we find the nearest point on the base surface. The UV coordinates of this point are then used to look up the appearance parameters in a supplied texture mapped onto the surface. Coming back to our example from before, we can make use of a texture to vary appearance parameters spatially as well. For instance, here we apply a checkerboard pattern to modulate the length of the orange fibers. Finally, we can also track the ray footprint and feed the network the current radius of the cone, enabling the network to predict a correctly filtered radiance value at each point. To enable the network to learn this filtered response, we train on filtered input images with a randomly chosen filter radius. In our experiments, we found that simply supplying the ray footprint like this, together with all other parameters, yields good results similar to using integrated positional encodings introduced by Barron and others. Integrated positional encodings are however more sophisticated, and we expect them to outperform our approach in certain scenarios. In summary, combining the instancing scheme with this mapping of light, appearance and filter parameters yields a flexible model that is able to capture and render mesoscale appearances 
free from aliasing artifacts with artistic control similar to that of traditional methods. Let me now outline our contributions and point out some possible directions for further work. Focusing on a small patch enables nerf text to represent a space of appearances with a single MLP. Instancing then allows to cover arbitrary surfaces while enabling the use of textures for artistic control over that space. Our new primitive is also capable of producing filtered, aliasing free results and presents a general method to learn different classes of mesoscale appearances. While nerf text shows great versatility, the visual quality and speed of our new primitive does not yet match that of classical primitives tailored to a specific material. Furthermore, the patch placement is not optimal and can lead to visual artifacts. Finally, there are quite a few directions for further research using our method as a starting point. Our method already allows to be integrated with traditional rendering methods if the assumption of parallel lighting is valid but it is not clear whether our reflectance field representation is optimal for integration into a path tracer. Other representations have been presented, for example one by Michel Guo and others, that only represents the phase function with a neural network. Work by Schwartz et al. and Chang et al. already shows that neural radiance fields can be trained using adversarial approaches. These methods are especially fitting for learning mesoscale appearances, as we are not interested in exact reconstruction in the setting, but would profit from the increased variance of patches generated by GAN. Finally, while we exclusively use synthetic datasets for now, it would be interesting to apply our method to real-world data, which could be obtained, for example, using a light stage. Another promising direction would be to enable capture with a smartphone, allowing practically everyone to capture an appearance from a real-world example and applying it to a 3D model, similar to the approach by B and others. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Hendrik, for an amazing talk. It seems like you've already gathered uh, a lot of uh, questions from the audience, so let's, let's kick off with those. Um, could you please explain again how the NERF network learns to interpret the texture appearance parameters? So um, during training time, um, next to the, uh, the, the pixel value, right, the radiance value and um, um, the opacity, we also feed um, the parameter value. So our data set con contains um, not static patches, but a set of um, patches with different, uh, different parameters. And we feed these parameters as well as the radiance uh, to the network during training. Got it. So essentially like the, the view direction. Uh, sure, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's just right. Every parameter that changes the appearance is just another parameter to the network. Yeah. Um, second question is quite fun. Did you try your method over meshes of animals? How bad or good were the artifacts on these meshes? Uh, well, you can read our paper and <laughs> take a look at them because there's um, there are two um, examples. One is a cat and the other one is a sheep. And to, to summarize, they, they look decent. I mean, they're, I, I mentioned this, we're not at the moment at the, at the stage where we outperform the best um, of fur rendering that's available. But for, with the fact that we can also, that we also have this LOD, this dynamic LOD in there, and also the ability to change the parameters on the fly, it's pretty decent. Nice. Uh, one more from the audience. Uh, does the synthetic data require interpolation of parameters or incoming light? If yes, how do you properly sample this, this space? If not, how does it generalize to any omega i? Um, let me read the question again. I'm not sure what you mean with interpolation of parameters, to be honest. <laughs> Could you elaborate on that, maybe? Well, in the meantime, uh, maybe I can ask a, a little question and then we can loop, loop back ahead. to this one. Um, oh, there we go. Oh, I guess covering all of these parameters in the training set. Yeah, so the training set has to be quite large to cover all the parameters in case there are many parameters. So we train with 5,000 images um, per mm -hmm. patch that we train on. Oh, I think, I, let me take an interpretation of this question. And sure, I may go ahead. So I'd imagine that all the hyperparameters 
essentially build a hypercube sure. that you need to sample somehow? Are you yes. just drawing uniform random samples in here? Is it stratified? Yes. Is there a QMC? No, so the, the samples are taken uniformly at random, independently uniformly at random. Yeah. Gotcha. So, yeah. Okay. Let's let's move on to other questions. We can, you know, once you get into sampling theory, you can stay there forever. Um, I was thinking about uh, your future work where you mentioned integrating this into a path tracer. And mm -hmm. is that necessarily the best GI method to use in conjunction with Nerf text? Or could like a multi light, multi point light method be an easier integration task um, for like doing full GI with this? That's a good question. Um, not one I have a direct answer to. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, possibly, possibly. Got it. And uh, how is it Yeah, hmm? dude, go ahead, read the, read the question. Uh, oh, there was a new question. I, yeah, I think you have to scroll down, or I can read them as well. I, one you of the go ahead. You go ahead. How the, how the training data is generated. Um, so, in principle, we write, we have a Blender file that has a parametric, parametric patch of fur or grass or whatever patch we want to train on and um, expose a couple of parameters. For example, in the example I showed, the curliness of the fur or the length of um, some of the fibers. And we can just um, create an image by sampling the parameters uniformly at random and sampling a pose and sampling a right, light direction and then render this image and have with the parameters our training sample. And there's one more question. Did you try with different sizes of Nerf text patches? Um, no. Um, at the moment, this, the patch sizes are very, relatively uh, similar. Cool. Let's uh, see if there are any YouTube questions. If not, I think we'll, uh, we'll thank you again, Hendrik, for a great talk. And uh, with that, we can conclude the session. Thanks a lot.
Hello everyone. My name is Giannis Pilekas and I'm be happy and I'm happy to be chairing the third session of EGSR 2021 on differentiable rendering. We have uh, three exciting papers in this session. Before we start, I want to emphasize that if you want to ask questions, you should feel free to do so, and you can do so in three ways. First, you can I'll post on YouTube on the live chat that you are watching from the YouTube stream. Second, you can post in the chat we have here on the OEA platform. And third, you can also use your video and jump on the box that appears on the top left above the chat during the Q&A sessions to uh, ask your question orally and also interact with both the first author and uh, myself. And if you can do the last thing, it's actually preferable because it's making these sessions a lot more live. All right, so just uh, let's jump, jump uh, straight into the three papers. The first paper is titled Unified Shape and SVBRDF Recovery Using Differentiable Monte Carlo Rendering. The paper will be presented by Fujun Luan, who is a PhD student at Cornell University and was interning at the Facebook Reality Labs when this work was taking place. And it's co authored by Swang Zhao, Kavita Bala, and Zhao Dong. So let's listen to Fujun's presentation. Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming to this talk. Uh, today, I will present our 3D capture work on using differentiable motor color rendering. I'm Fujun from Connor University, and uh, this work is a collaboration with Professor Shang Zhao from UC Irvine, Professor Kavita Bala from Connor University, and uh, Dr. Zhao Dong from Facebook Reality Labs. So this slide show an uh, overview of our pipeline. So basically we want to uh, perform 3D reconstruction of an object that we want to jointly recover its geometry and also material properties uh, represented by specially varying BRDF. We start by using a handheld device such as a mobile phone with LED flashlight and uh, capture around the object for roughly 100 images in a relatively dark room. And then we have this set of photos as our optimization input. We will recover the camera poses and uh, get a rough initialization of the geometry using CoMap. And then we will jointly optimize both the geometry and the materials using uh, differentiable rendering. After that, the pipeline of our method will output a triangle mesh, which is the refined geometry, and also a set of PBR textures. And this traditional graphics uh, format can directly be reused in uh, graphics path tracers or AR and VR environments, such as the picture shown on the right, which is rendered using a path tracer in a virtual scene. So inverse rendering uh, is really popular nowadays. The rendering basically takes uh, some input of the scene information, including the geometry, the materials, and also the camera position and the lighting information. Um, they are described as the variable x. And the rendering, you can think of it as a black box function f, which takes such 3D information as input and uh, output an image y. And the inverse rendering is basically the reverse of this process that uh, tries to take a set of photos or images as input y and then uh, try to apply this reverse process that you can try to infer this unknown 3D parameters such as the geometry, the materials, and the lighting. So in this case, since we are using a differentiable rendering, uh, everything is differentiable and you can uh, back propagate the loss functions gradients all the way back to the unknown variables. In our case, we define a loss function, g, uh, which takes the input of the rendered image and also a target photo and try to optimize the loss, uh, the objective function. In this case, we are applying uh, L2 loss, the MIC error, on the rendered image of our reconstructed model in the current iteration and the target photo. Here we show uh, on the left the optimization animation uh, of each iteration. And on the right is the target photo for this particular view. And you can see that the method of our uh, pipeline try to uh, jointly optimize the geometry and also recover its uh, specially varying BRDF. 
after we get this optimization finished, we will get a, a triangle mesh with refined geometry details and also a set of textures that we can directly reuse it for relighting, such as the picture shown in the middle, which basically we change the illumination to be another environment map. And also we can reuse this model in other traditional graphics pipelines, relighting it and use it in path tracers, such as the one in the middle, which is rendered in Blender. So the key to this uh, project is that we uh, have this uh, really fast differentiable renderer called PSDR CUDA, which is mainly developed by uh, Professor Shang Zhao from UC Irvine. Uh, right now it's public uh, and uh, you can find it on GitHub. So basically this method, uh, this renderer use um, NVIDIA Optics with CUDA F acceleration and use Enoki, which is an AutoDiv library, uh, the same one as used in uh, Misuba 2, and also it provides Python interfaces uh, by uh, combining C++ with PyBind. So we evaluate the performance of the retracing uh, PSDR CUDA versus like a popular rasterization-based methods, in this case, the PyTorch 3D. And we realized that, uh, in fact, using our retracing-based uh, renderer is not slower compared to rasterized, uh, rasterization based methods. So in this case, uh, both renderers uh, render 1K by 1K image can take very uh, short time, like a smaller than 0 0.2 seconds per image. And uh, in this case, we want to apply both renderers on this simple test that we start from some Kinect Fusion initial mesh uh, shown on the left, the left image of this teapot. And we want to run, uh, optimize its geometry, assuming known diffuse material, and uh, see if we can get uh, good reconstruction quality by using only the differentiable rendering uh, image loss. And here I'm showing animation video of the optimization process using PyTorch 3D. Uh, on the left is the uh, animate, sorry, the animation of the uh, PyTorch 3D method. As you can see, uh, the handle of teapot is slowly growing back. And on the right, we are showing the error map uh, compared to ground truth. You can see that PyTorch 3D is trying to reconstruct the, the missing part back, but still uh, it's not able to reconstruct some part of the geometry, especially the right uh, part of the handle. You can see even running longer time, uh, the, the, the red part of the handle is still missing. And uh, here we show our method. So basically we are running uh, the same setup, same number of input views, same learning rate, but we replace the, the renderer engine by using our PSDR CUDA. So you can see that by using unbiased age sampling, uh, you can get correct gradients for update, updating the vertex positions. And uh, note that the right part of the handle is also reconstructed back. So we get better reconstruction quality compared to rasterizers. And we also evaluate uh, our 3D reconstruction quality uh, compared with some other traditional baselines and also differentiable renderers. In this slide, uh, the, the leftmost column is the initial mesh, which is obtained by using Kinect Fusion with some uh, depth maps. And uh, the, the second column, the, the third column are like a essentially very similar. They are using a soft rasterizer as the key algorithm, which basically make the triangles uh, blurry and a little transparent such that you can get more gradients back propagated to other triangles. But you can see uh, the, the details of the geometry reconstructed is still missing, and there are some visible artifacts. Misuba 2, in this case, is faster and also slightly better, but they're also using an approximation for the gradient, so it's a biased gradient estimation. And in this case, we show that the quality of the geometry is still less good by using this kind of gradients. So recently, there is another renderer called NVDIF REST from NVIDIA, and it's another uh, rasterizer, but it's uh, using anti-aliasing to get better gradient estimate. And it's also very fast. In our uh, ablation study, you can see that 
the quality is actually not bad. And uh, yeah, uh, our renderer basically uh, reconstructed the, the best quality uh, in this case. Uh, and the, you, as you can see that compared to the ground truth uh, showing on the rightmost, our reconstruction uh, is uh, with the, the least error. And uh, in this slide, we show uh, comparison with more traditional methods uh, such as CoMap and uh, Kinect Fusion. So you can see that CoMap usually can get good results when the input image uh, is with uh, strong texture, such that you can find the correspondence across waves, such as shown in this uh, peak model. And uh, when this in the Hello Kitty model, there is not a very strong texture uh, features it basically failed very bad in this case, and Kinect Fusion tend to uh, produce over smoothed surfaces with a lot of fine details missing. And our result in this case also produce the best match to the ground truth. So in our pipeline, there are a few priors and regularizations uh, that try to make it more robust. The first one is cost to fine optimization. Basically, we start from a coarse uh, triangle mesh and uh, optimize using that one. After the, the silhouette and the overall shape is matched to the target, we remesh it and subdivide the triangles to be like smaller triangles. And we repeat this process and uh, progressively refine the, the details of the geometry. This helps to avoid local minimums in the optimization. And uh, there are other priors such as uh, local smoothness. We apply La uh, Laplacian smoothing for the geometry to avoid uh, bumpy surfaces uh, in, the, in the tiny uh, detail part, and also some smoothness in the texture. And uh, we also apply robust uh, surface evolution. Basically, we want to avoid any uh, self-intersections or uh, holes in the uh, evolution of the surface and we rely on remeshing to improve the topology quality. And here we show some results. So in this slide, we show uh, some real-world data. Basically, we captured using a uh, flashlight uh, cell phone uh, around 100 images, and we reconstruct the, the final model, jointly optimizing the geometry and the materials. And we show the geometry normal and also a relighting result using a different environment map. And here we show a video of all the reconstructed models rendered in a path tracer in Blender, cycle rendering. And you can see that by changing the illumination, we can still get uh, relatively good results without visible artifacts. And uh, basically, uh, in this case, everything is with global illumination. So you can see some interreflections between the objects and also shadows. OK. And we can also use our model because it's uh, in the traditional graphics format. It's a triangle mesh and PBR textures. So you can easily apply AR and VR uh, tool, tool set to do, like, for example, in this case, object insertion of the Hello Kitty to a real, real world photo. And uh, we can also use our model in other global illumination scene setup. Like, for example, in this case, we place our reconstructed model in a virtual uh, box or some other editings of the, uh, the scenes with our models. The project website is uh, shown on the left top, and also you can scan the QR code. Thank you for listening. All right. So thanks for doing for the great presentation. Uh, there are already a few questions in the chat. Let me just remind everyone that if you're attending from OJ, you can also ask your questions by clicking on the box right above uh, the chat and uh, talking to us and showing your video. So the first question on the chat by Marcus Vorhel says, great work. How do you recover light parameters like intensity or color? Are they also optimized? So uh, hello, can you hear? Yeah. Uh, so basically, uh, in this project, we are basically always using like a the, the like a iPhone LED flashlight. So we basically assume that the light uh, color will be white. So there is like a no 
uh, RGB choices, basically just one parameter. And in the optimization, we will also uh, fine tune the light lighting intensity with some reasonable initialization. So yeah, it's also optimized. OK. Yeah. Uh, another question is by Juan Raul Padron Grife. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, really impressive results and amazing contribution. How robust is the differentiable render to different geometry initializations? I actually had the same question in the sense that I noticed that in a lot of the models, uh, Kinect Fusion gives a pretty good initialization. Obviously, a lot of detail is missing, but you get a nice surface that has about the right topology. So if you yes. were to start from, say, a sphere, and you wanted to deform that into your shape, would that work well, or? Yeah, would so actually, uh, in this project, we uh, originally start, started with more aggressive, like a bad initializations, uh, when we were testing the geometry component for this project. And we start with really bad initializations, usually, uh, so Kinect Fusion usually is pretty robust, and you, if you give it a reasonable depth map, they will give you something that is uh, maybe over smoothed, but still pretty good in the topology. And uh, at our, our uh, beginning of this project, I started with really aggressive, uh, low res, noisy depth maps. And uh, basically that gave me like a really bad topology with holes and uh, like a really far away geometry neutralization. But if we can use cross to fine and uh, run the optimization longer, as long as they are not really bad topology, like for example, you want to start from a sphere to something with a lot of holes, like a torus with a bunch of holes, not that crazy, then usually they will give you some reasonable results. Like the, the, the one I show in the teapot, that the handle is missing for the right part. Although it will not connect the triangles uh, in the topology sense, they will try to push the, 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 the two triangle boundaries to be closer, to close the gap. Uh, but still, I don't think a uh, mesh-based method is very suitable for handling very complex topology changes. Like, uh, like if you want to use NERF or SDF, that will be easier. For example, it's just a simple case, you have a sphere, you want to deform to a torus. Mesh-based uh, technique right now is still a little uh, less convenient, I think, compared to like a NERF type of methods. Yeah. Makes sense. There is one more question by Abhijit Ghos. Uh, Abhijit is asking, how does it work for very specular objects you showed with a fixed number of last photographs? Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? Which one is it? So I think Abhijit is asking, given that you have a fixed, relatively small number of last photographs, how does your work, uh, how does your technique work with uh, very specular objects that typically require very dense uh. number of viewpoints to be reconstructed? Yeah, so uh, I think for most of our real world data, we captured roughly 100 images, at least like covered the, the, the hemisphere centered around the object. Uh, but we did have some ablation study for synthetic data about the number of input views for the like a final result quality. And, and uh, basically, if you have fewer images, the spiker map will be worse, the quality. Basically, when you render, we render it in another different lighting condition, uh, you have to put strong, like a stronger priors to prevent overfitting to the training wheels, especially when the object is more specular. Because if you don't have a strong smoothing prior, they will try to overfit the highlight to the limited number of training wheels. And those will make artifacts in the specular map. And uh, if you re-render in a different view or different lighting condition, that will show artifacts. But uh, in this project, we acknowledge that our spy, uh, material part is not very strong. And uh, we are actually thinking about uh, the like, next steps about using like neural priors, like learning-based priors to like, better regularize uh, specular albedo and roughness. All right. So we're out of time for questions. Let's thank Fujun again. Uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah. Yeah. the next paper in the station is titled Material and Lighting Reconstruction for Complex Indoor Scenes with Texture Space Differentiable Rendering. 
presented by Merlin Emir David from EPFL, and it's also co-authored by Zhao Dong, Wenzel Jacob, and Anton Gablania. So let's take a look. Hello everyone, my name is Merlin and I will present our work on reconstructing materials and lighting of complex indoor scenes with differentiable rendering. This is joint work with Zhao Dong, Vincent Jacob, and Anton Kaplanian. Being able to accurately reconstruct real-world places digitally is the starting point for a number of important applications. This includes, for example, meeting in VR in a shared place, but also democratizing 3D content creation, and importantly, enabling generation of high-quality training data, for example, to train autonomous robots. The problem of capturing the real world has been approached via many angles, and I'll briefly mention a few examples now. There are methods that focus on reconstructing only indoor lighting or recovering only materials, and there are methods recovering both materials and shape of single objects. There are even methods recovering the shape, material, and illumination but that's typically limited to a single object or a single viewpoint. And finally, there are methods that recover lighting and materials of entire rooms while taking into account global illumination. The method of Zheng and colleagues on the left is more focused toward a refurnishing application, and so it cares less about accurately capturing the existing room contents. Our work is closest to the right-hand paper by Asinovich and colleagues. At a high level, we adopt the same analysis by synthesis approach with differentiable rendering, but we also figured out all of the design choices and details that are required to make it work on real captured data. We ran our method on the replica data set, which contains geometry, RGB textures, and more for 18 indoor scenes. They were captured with a handheld video rig, which alternates the exposure time at every frame so that even bright emitters are captured correctly in at least some of the frames. There is also an instant segmentation defined over scene surfaces, as well as other inputs that we don't use. This dataset provides high quality geometry and even a merged color texture. But the issue is that this texture has lighting and shadows baked in. This prevents applications that involve relighting, scene editing, and even re-rendering because some view dependent effects such as uh, glossy highlights are missing, as we can see on the right. So our objective is to take this capture and quite literally invert the light transport process to recover the scene's materials and lighting parameters. Let's look at how we do that in more detail. We use an analysis by synthesis approach with differentiable path tracing. Using the provided geometry, reference images, and camera positions, we render the current state of the scene. This rendering step is differentiable and carried out in texture space, which I'll explain shortly. We compare this rendering to the reference images via an objective function and obtain gradients with respect to the scene parameters. Finally, we take a gradient descent step to update the scene parameters and start over until convergence. OK, but what are the scene parameters that we are optimizing exactly? In other words, how do we parameterize the scene? Because the geometry was generated from a scan rather than modeled by hand, we can't expect to get a nicely separated mesh for each object. We just assume that it comes as a single large mesh. Moreover, we don't know where the emitters are on this mesh. So to strike a balance between representative power and feasibility, we decided to optimize four parameters that are textured. An emission value, a diffuse base color or albedo, a roughness parameter, and a specularity parameter. This is essentially a subset of the Disney BRDF. The nice thing about this parameterization is that the texture we will produce will, can be used directly by other renderers. OK, so it all sounds good so far, but unfortunately, if we try to apply what I've just described directly to a complex real-world scene, we will run into a lot of issues. And so this paper is really about finding out what it takes to make it work at this scale and despite all of the imperfections of the input data. Let me show you what I mean. On this target image, Let's just optimize the parameters I listed before with differentiable rendering. OK, so that actually looks like a pretty good reconstruction. But if we look at the emission values that were chosen by the optimization, we see that the results are completely absurd. The optimization runs straight to the closest local minimum, which makes the whole scene a giant light source that emits just the right color at every point. Something similar happens for the roughness and specularity parameters. If we just let the optimization run without any constraint, 
we again get a very close match, but the specularity and glossiness were only increased exactly at the location of the reflections, which is really not what we want. To avoid this issue, we decided to restrict the number of degrees of freedom. Using an instance segmentation, all points in the same class share one roughness and specularity value. These segmented classes are also used to detect the position of emitters, and that explained in more detail in the paper. Effectively, fewer degrees of freedom guides the optimization to more plausible results. Next, we'll look at our proposed texture space sampling scheme and see why it helps. By default, path tracing samples primary rays starting from the camera and toward the scene. And so at each iteration, we would get dense observations of exactly what the camera has seen and nothing everywhere else. If we look at the resulting gradients, we see that we only get non-zero gradients in the frustum of this iterations camera. Unfortunately, for a real-life capture, we can't assume that these viewpoints or cameras are perfectly evenly distributed. In fact, if we look at the histogram of observation counts for each scene point, we can see that the coverage is very une uneven. By default, regions that are observed more would converge faster than the other regions, and we'd really like to and avoid this uneven convergence. It's a bit like training a classifier on an unbalanced dataset. To address this issue, we propose using texture space sampling to generate primary rays. Instead of starting rays from the cameras, we start by picking texels uniformly at random over texture space. We then use a pre-computed inverse UV mapping to find the corresponding scene surface points. And finally, we connect these surface points directly to the cameras. You can think of this as a stratification technique. As a result, we obtain non-zero gradients of similar magnitude all over texture space, which leads to much smoother convergence. There are some additional considerations about Jacobian factors, which are described in the paper. There is one last technique I wanted to highlight in the talk. This is a problem that comes up when running an optimization using noisy gradients, and only some of the variables are observed in each iteration. Consider, for example, optimizing the texture of this table with the Adam optimizer. The top half of the texture is used for the tabletop and will be seen in most iterations, while the bottom half will be observed only once in a while. In the first iteration, we get an observation for the bottom of the table, so the bottom half of the texture gets some non-zero gradients. And these gradients are noisy because they were computed with path tracing. The optimizer takes a step and updates the texture values. So far, so good. But Imagine now that we don't observe the bottom of the table again for the next several iterations. The top part of the texture gets updated correctly, but the bottom part, which has received zero gradients, keeps getting updated because of the optimizer's momentum. What that means is that those noisy gradients from the first iteration will get applied over and over again until there is a new observation or until the momentum dies down. In the end, the noise pattern gets burned in which of course is undesirable. In our application, this actually happens constantly because we optimize these giant 4K textures and we only get gradients for a small subset of the texels at each iteration. Once the problem has been identified, there is a simple fix, which consists in restricting variables and state updates to the texels that actually received non-zero gradients in the current iteration. With that fix given the same gradients as before, the results make a lot more sense. There are several other important ideas described in the paper, including discarding gradients of indirect observations and using a course to find scheme. Now let's have a look at some results. To evaluate reconstruction quality, we look at re-rendered images on the left, right next to the corresponding reference images on the right. The reference video looks a bit choppy, and that's simply because we show every third frame to avoid flickering due to the exposure changes. As I mentioned earlier, this type of physically-based inverse rendering unlocks some really cool applications such as full relighting. In this video, we turned off the original lights and replaced them with a daylight simulation. Having the correct lighting and materials means that inserting new objects in the scene will automatically look right. We can move freely in the scene and even run some physics simulations for fun. Here, we compare our results to a baseline, which simply takes the median of all observations. 
As you can see, it's missing some important reflections and glossy highlights, which makes the scene look a lot less realistic. Finally, we compare to the method of Asinovich and colleagues, which also uses differentiable rendering. Their method was mostly applied to synthetic scenes, and we can see how the new pipeline manages to avoid artifacts such as Monte Carlo noise in the textures and incorrect glossy reflections. There are additional results and comparisons in the paper, including an ablation study and results on a synthetic scene. We're reaching the end of the talk, but before concluding, I'd like to mention some of our method limitations. First, we take the scene geometry as input and leave it exactly as is. This means that, for example, if some thin features are missing, they won't be added back in our reconstruction. More importantly, if the geometry is missing for an emitter, such as this light bulb, it, its emission will be incorrectly attributed to the surrounding surface color instead. We also don't handle transparent surfaces at all. For example, we're supposed to see the table through the back of this chair, but our reconstruction incorrectly gave it the table's color instead. To recap, we've presented a robust pipeline based on differentiable rendering to recover lighting and materials in complex indoor scenes. We propose a texture space sampling scheme, as well as several detailed techniques which enable robust convergence. We believe these techniques can be easily adopted by other projects that rely on differentiable rendering. Finally, our method outputs textures that are ready to use in standard renderers, enabling many applications, such as realistic training data generation. And this concludes my talk. Thank you very much for watching. All right. So thank you, Marilyn, for the great presentation. The great okay. for the applause to die out. All right. So there is already a question on the chat. Thank you for the talk. How do you handle camera rays that hit a part of the geometry that they are not supposed to? That will lead to wrong material conversion, would it not? Yeah, exactly. So um, if your camera is slightly misaligned, which happens all the time, or if your uh, geometry is slightly off, like uh, let's say the leg of the chair is a bit too wide or too narrow, um, some of these rays will be uh, hitting the wrong parts of the geometry. And this is just unavoidable. And indeed, we had a lot of trouble initially with, um, with this kind of uh, wrong attribution. And honestly, the, the solution was um, the combination of all of the little techniques that we um, uh, show in the paper. And that includes taking uh, small, careful steps um, with gradients clamping and so on, doing uh, coarse to fine optimization. And the texture space uh, sampling scheme also means that you will be getting inside of each iteration, you will be getting observations from multiple viewpoints. So if one camera hits the wrong part of the object, maybe um, another camera will be uh, getting from a different angle and will get the correct observation. So overall, uh, the combination of all of these techniques allows you to converge to a reasonable um, thing. But actually, yeah, if you have, for example, uh, some thin structure that's missing completely from the geometry and you just apply naive uh, optimization, you will see this shape being projected all over the place, all over your scene, and it's really terrible. So yeah, we had to deal with that. <laughs> Makes sense, yeah. Jumao Lee is asking, have you tried adding geometry optimization to the pipeline? We have Jumao here. Hi, Tsuma. Um, yeah. So it's definitely uh, interesting future work. So. Uh, the story is we, we started this project uh, bef uh, with which implemented inside of Mitsuba 2, and um, there was no support for uh, optimizing geometry at the time. And uh, there are you know already a huge number of variables to optimize. So each of these parameters has a, a 4K texture, and um, handling that additional degree of freedom was kind of out of scope for this project. Additionally to the geometry, I think refining the camera positions would be really great. And you could do both of these staying within the framework of differentiable rendering. Yep. OK, cool. Thanks. <laughs> yep. Uh, another question by Arpita Garval is, did you try with misaligned geometry? Um, so I would, I would say yes, because all of the geometry is misaligned. So it is um, high quality scan 
but if you actually uh, superimpose the, the renderings with the um, uh, with the re-renderings, you will see like none of the edges actually match. So I would say that we have uh, we have also some ablation study uh, in the paper or some some experiment in the paper where we uh, additionally in introduce some noise in the geometry and see how the reconstructions fare. Um, but yeah, basically handling those mismatches and misalignments is is, uh, is what the paper is about, pretty much. Makes sense. And there is one more question in the chat by Animes Karnavar. What method do you use for the instant segmentation? Right. So luckily, the Replica dataset has a high quality uh, instant segmentation that they provide. And I believe it was generated with some <laughs> convolutional neural network. I'm actually not familiar with the detail. And then we additionally did an experiment in the supplemental where the instant segmentation is just generated with a simple heuristic with um, curvature. And we use, uh, you know, in Blender, you can generate some UV maps. And so it will split your mesh in islands. And we just kind of use these islands as the segmentation and use some additional curvature information. So just these simple heuristics, it was actually doing really well. So we found that it was not super sensitive. Makes sense. I had one more question of my own. Um, mm -hmm. How you use this uh, nice technique, texture space sampling, to effectively do a form of stratification in your unknowns? That's right. How different does this perform compared to doing, say, area sampling? Because area sampling also does a form of stratification. It's probably worse. For example, if some texture is applied to a very large area in the scene, you would end up you would end up sampling that more than some other part of the texture. At the same yeah. time, it's keeping the problem a little less nonlinear by avoiding having to do to deal with the texture mapping, right? The extra right. texture that come out of that. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, we, we haven't tried, but I think that's a very viable variant of, of this technique. Uh, we could just scrap the texture part and sample directly uniformly over the surface. We just wanted to truly uniformly sample over variables so that all of the variables converge uh, at the same time. And I would say the complexity is not that much. We just um, uh, pre-compute the inverse UV mapping, uh, and then we use it at runtime. I think there is no overhead uh, in terms of performance. So um, th there is not much cost to actually using the texture space, I believe. Regarding but, the mapping, hmm. yeah, I was talking not so much about overhead in terms of uh, computational overhead, but mostly that the more nonlinear you make the problem, the, harder, the slower you make convergence, potentially you're introducing more local minima and so on. Uh huh. Um, so the, the this inverse texture mapping is not really part of the optimization. It's just kind of used as a lookup function. Okay. So I would say that the landscape, like the optimization problem, is the same, but we um, we just feed different data points uh, to the optimization. If that makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. All right. So there is one last question. I think we can answer it quickly. How did you impose the physically based restrictions for light emission? Um, so basically, the, we use a black body emitter um, that has a, well, we use a scaled black body emitter. But anyway, the, the only restriction that we imposed is just that we uh, clamped the emission to be positive. And, uh, and then it can be large. But in practice, if it got too large, it uh, would anyway destroy your image. So uh, we didn't have to do much for it to get correct. Um, correct emission. And, and you know, we have HDR reference images. So I mean, not HDR, HDR, but multiplex HDR. So every third frame has a different exposure, which allows us to have uh, some uh, supervision for these uh, emitter values. All right. So let's thank Melden again for uh, the presentation and the Q&A. Thank you. All right. So the last paper in this the last paper in this session is titled "Appearance Driven Automatic 3D Model Simplification." It's presented by uh, John Hasselgren, excuse me, from Nvidia, and it's co-authored by Jacob Markberg, Jaco Lehtinen, Mika Etala, and uh, Samuel Ilaina. Hello. I'm John, and I will be presenting our work on appearance-driven automatic 3D model simplification.
When starting out, we had the goal of doing level of detail using deep learning or in particular differentiable rasterization. And then level of detail is pretty important because uh, you need to improve rendering performance in computer games. Um, you want to reduce the triangle count in your models. So showing with an example below here, um, you have to the right a reference model with 1.2 million triangles, pretty highly complex object. And then you can create this uh, proxy geometry shown on the left with just 11,000 triangles. Um, and as you can see, the proxy geometry on the whole uh, captures the shape and appearance of the reference quite well. So if you render this at a certain distance from the observer, you will probably not be able to tell any difference. Another thing that's uh, perhaps even more important than reducing triangle count is that you can reduce the aliasing. So when you simplify the geometry, you typically don't suffer as much from aliasing due to point sampling when rendering it. But sometimes you can also change the representation. So here on the right, you have an object with geometry. And on the left, we've changed some of the geometry into transparent texture, and therefore we can filter it better. So some background, the traditional level of detail pipeline I will show you now, and um, it's currently used in most games as well today. So what you have is uh, you have a reference mesh, highly detailed coming in on the left here, and we show it here in wireframe as well as shaded. Then you run it through a mesh simplification algorithm, and you get the simplified uh, proxy geometry. So the mesh simplification algorithms they typically greatly remove geometry bit by bit, for example, by clustering vertexes or uh, collapsing edges. And they typically optimize for metrics such as preserving the volume of the original mesh as well as possible. Then you take your simplified mesh as well as your reference mesh and you feed it into a normal map baking system. And the normal map baking system will uh, bake micro details into the normal map and instead represent them using shading. And you typically do this by ray tracing from the simplified mesh to the reference mesh and then you store the deviation of the normal in, in a texture. And then finally, you can take this simplified normal map mesh as well as the reference and you can run BSDF pre-filtering to get your final simplified and filtered result. And the point of BSDF pre-filtering is typically to reduce aliasing in specular highlights. And you do this very simplified by making your materials rougher or more diffuse, especially when you have lots of detail. So our dream was instead kind of based on the notion of if something looks good, then it is good. So we want to take the reference on the left here. We want to have something that we don't really know what it is that optimizes everything. And then because we're just going to use this simplified mesh here for rendering, we don't really care about anything else than we just want it to look the same as the reference. So we just want to minimize the image loss. But the question is then, what do you put into this black box? How do you optimize this problem? If we look at the forward process, it's pretty simple actually. We can start from some kind of initial guess on the left, where you have the mesh. Uh, you just start from a sphere in this example. And then you have some material textures, we just pick some random noise. And then of course we have a renderer, so we can just render it and it's gonna look like noisy sphere. And then we can actually compute an image space loss from the target. So in this case, the loss is gonna be really big because the guess is very bad. But then what we can do is actually, we can just use differentiable rendering straight off and we can use the error to backpropagate through differentiable renderer and update our, what we now call the later representation because it's not the initial guess anymore. It's gonna change gradually. And this is basically all that we need to do. So if we run this process, you can see that we start with the sphere and after a hundred steps, it's gonna start morphing somewhat into saxophone and then after 500 steps, it looks even more like the saxophone, 1200 steps. And when we're done, we're having a pretty good uh, proxy geometry for the saxophone with some problems admittedly here around the pipe because we started from a sphere with a low genius. So we can't really capture this complex geometry. 
but the takeaway here is uh, that level of detail and inverse rendering is actually the same thing. There's been many papers that have been using networks or uh, complex shading models that are based on deep learning. But what you can do is actually that you can just use a very simple inverse renderer and you can just update the mesh by itself. Here is an overview of our system. So we start here from the left with a quite simple latent representation. We just have a mesh and some textures containing the material parameters. And uh, the materials are implemented using standard BSDFs, uh, which are typically used in games as well. So we chose this very deliberately so that we can take our output and directly import it in our real engine, for example. Uh, we render the asset using a differentiable rendering pipeline where we have some functionality to construct tangent space, we can do animation skinning, displacement mapping, and so on. And of course, we have a differentiable renderer here. It's a differentiable rasterizer using deferred shading. So we get the image uh, of the statue shown on the left here, and we compare it using a visual image loss of the reference shown on the right. And what's quite nice here is that you can, of course, render the reference using the same rendering pipeline as we showed here, but you can actually swap out the reference render with anything you like. So you can, for example, use a path tracer or a sign distance field renderer. And this, of course, also uh, holds for the model. So you can use the obvious uh, mesh reference model, but you can also use sign distance fields. And in that case, you will convert from a sign distance field into a mesh representation using the system. And this is the meat of our implementation. So I will show you that you can actually apply this to a vast variety of applications. And our first application was also our first experiment. So it's the most simple one. We start from an initial guess here, which is just a sphere. We optimize the vertex positions as well as a normal map jointly. And then we get the results as shown to the right here. So we get a pretty good proxy of the reference. Uh, it's not completely without artifacts, but as you can see, we've reduced from 700,000 to just 3,000 triangles. So given that, it's a pretty good result. The thing that we can do is actually we can start from an initial guess that's based on an automatic mesh simplification tool. In this case, we used Simplicon to reduce the mesh. And in this case, we can expect to get much better result. So we're showing here the result that we get with our system, as well as the result that you would get with Simplicon by doing a two-step, reducing the mesh and then baking normal maps. So as you can see here, we both improved the PSNR score and improved the quality of the image. We can somewhat improve the quality of the silhouette as well as fixing up some normal issues here. We can, of course, extend this to uh, baking textures for fully physically based BSDFs. In this case, we have a mesh from the Paragon asset. We're baking specular texture for the reduced mesh, albedo, and normal map. And down here, we're just showing the wireframe for the two meshes, so you can see the difference. This was actually also used in a mesh simplification repair example that we had in the paper. So here we've used uh, an automatic mesh simplifier that's been introducing errors into the simplified mesh. And you can see here it's detached some geometry from the main mesh. And there's a lot of texturing problems in this area in particular, especially when you compare the, the reference here. So what we can't do is we can't really create the manifold mesh from a non-manifold mesh. But as you can see here in the middle, we're actually able to address most of the artifacts. We're visually able to attach this thing to the mesh again. And you can see here that while there are still some artifacts, we're capturing most of the appearance of this problematic region. We can also apply our system to aggregate geometry. So in this case, we start from a highly detailed reference mesh here of a foliage. We create an initial guess, which is just basically a billboard cloud as shown here. But we can actually, in this case, we could automatically create the initial guess by just inserting a quad into every scene graph node of the, the scene reference scene on the right. And then we run our system 
optimizing for alpha transparency in textures in this case. And we get the result as shown to the, uh, in the middle. So we're basically approximating all the shape and appearance in this case through texturing. If you apply it to full scale scene, it looks like this. It's our result with just 20 million triangles for the entire scene with very dense foliage. Here is what it would look like when rendering the reference. It's 5.1 billion triangles in this case. And if I swap back to our, back to the reference, back to our, back to the reference, you can see that there are some details that are changing, but overall we're uh, capturing the appearance of the reference quite well. We can also handle animation fairly easily. All we have to do is to pick a random animation frame for each training iteration, and we will optimize for the average error. And here we can actually train uh, skinning weights in addition to the normal shape and appearance of the object. Finally, we can do joint shape and appearance pre-filtering. So in the bottom row of the animation here, you can see um, a simplified mesh rendered in 512 by 512 pixels resolution. And you can see that it resembles the reference fairly well. But if we instead go to 64 by 64 pixels resolution, the reference starts to alias a lot. So just by changing to a reference with a high sample count, we can create this pre-filtered mesh in the middle, which you can see aliases a lot less and has a lot uh, less temporal artifacts. In summary, we've shown that inverse rendering is a powerful tool for model simplification. You can do joint optimization of almost any parameters, such as shape, appearance, animation parameters, etc. We got a lot better performance than we initially expected in terms of runtime. And we think that this could allow for, for example, interactive modeling tools, but at the very least it would give quick iteration times while training. There are quite a few challenges remaining, practical things such as memory consumption. We use a lot of GPU memory at the moment, but it can also be quite hard to turn, tune the objective functions given that we have such a wide range of different meshes with different tessellations. And we finally, of course, rely on initial guess. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and point out that the code is publicly available on GitHub. So please check it out if you find it interesting. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? can hear you. You cannot see your camera. Uh, sorry? Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I don't have a, a camera, so I, I can't show video, I'm, I'm afraid. Yeah, no problem. All right. Yeah. So thank you for the great presentation. Uh, there is a question in the chat by Tobias Riti. How does this compare in timing to the traditional simplification pipeline? Yeah, so I, I would say it's it's quite expensive at the moment. So um, you, you, can, you can do pretty good trade-offs between quality and performance by changing rendering resolution during optimization. But when, when we did our uh, final quality runs for the paper results, it usually takes half an hour to an hour per mesh. So uh, compared to a traditional simplification pipeline, it's still quite expensive. But if you go down to 512 by 512 rendering resolution, we can have uh, almost almost interactive uh, uh, performance, I would say. It still, still, still takes some time to optimize, but you can see the processes that are happening at least in real time. All right. So while we're waiting for more questions from the audience, I have a few of my own. Uh, so one question is an, uh, an alternative to simplification, especially for very large messages, to use volume models. And uh, this is uh, this level of detail approach becoming quite popular or seeing a lot more popularity nowadays. And it's particularly helpful for things like foliage, like some of the impressive examples you saw. So how would you compare the strengths and weaknesses of the two approaches, simplifying the actual mess versus trying to replace the mess with a volumetric model? Yeah, I think, I think like you said, for, um, for foliage, I think the way you want to go long term is to replace it with a volumetric model because I think it's more expressive and powerful in, in that regard. Uh, for a short term solution, it's very nice for the game developers to have something they can directly import into their game engine so they can get, for example, a sliced mesh using our system with some transparency. 
So it, it's a trade-off, but I would say for quality, the volume approach is more appealing and for long term. Makes sense. So uh, Sabia Sati Mukherjee, I apologize for mispronouncing the name most likely, asks, how does image resolution affect output quality? Yeah, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not huge. We usually get pretty good quality from 512 by 512, which is usually what we use for draft runs, and it's serviceable. But uh, you, can, you can get some extra details um, by, by increasing the, the resolution. So if you want to have like especially good quality for a paper, then that's what you're going to do, basically. Um, there is also, for example, the case with pre-filtering when you're not actually, you're interested in tuning a resource to a certain rendering resolution. So then your rendering resolution is actually going to be what you intend to render the model at, at runtime instead of uh, as we did now for the paper, we are using a higher resolution so the mesh looks good under any viewing condition, basically. Makes sense. I had another question. Um, in the paper, it says that uh, we do not handle topology, which if I think, if I understood it correctly, means that once you are given initial mesh, you never update its triangles, its connectivity. So my experience, and this is also something that came up in the first paper in the session, is that if you are updating a mesh using these great differential rendering techniques, it ends up having such a bad topology in the end because of self-intersections and so on as you move around the triangle vertices that you really need to remesh. So is that uh, something that you didn't have to deal with? Or did you come up with some other way to address this issue that I didn't pick up from the paper? Yeah, so we actually experimented a bit with cost to fine optimization as well very early on. But I think the since our use case is somewhat different, we can get a really good initial guess using a off the shelf mesh simplifier tool. So we always found that the mesh simplifier is doing such a good job at making the initial guess in terms of topology, etc., that we never actually had any reason to do any hierarchical training or uh, remeshing. Okay. And it's it's also, you get the nice benefit of if you uh, create the 10,000 polygon mesh, then that's what you're going to get out as a result. So you can control your performance uh, really easily using that. All right. So there is one last question I think we can try answering fast. I assume you are randomly generating scenes for the rendering based loss. Which scene parameter do you sample? Camera, position, light position, and so on. Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, we're, we're usually just uh, sampling the camera in a random sphere, and uh, the light is also positioned in a random sphere. Usually we use a point light source, um, just for simplicity. And uh, since, since we're targeting a certain LOD, so a certain rendering resolution, we can just put the object at the intended distance from the camera, basically, and, and use that for training. So it's it's mainly camera and light position that we rotate around the object. And of course, time if you have an animated object as well. All right. So let's thank John and all of the speakers in this session again. Thank you. And, and before we close, before we close, there is an announcement from the organizers that the next session is going to start a little later than originally planned. It will start at uh, 6.27 Berlin time, so seven minutes after the, original, the originally planned starting time. All right, so thank you, everyone, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the EGSR.
Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this session of EGSR. We will have two exciting papers about noising rendering images. And the first paper is going to be uh, deep compositional denoising for high quality Monte Carlo rendering from uh, Zhang Xianyao and Marco Manzi, Vigis Vogels, Henrik Delberg, Marcus Gross, and Marius Papas. This talk will be a live talk. And uh, this talk will be live only and will not be recorded. This means that you want to invite all your friends and family because they don't want to miss the talk. And uh, we, let's welcome Shen Yao to give the presentation. Uh, called Real-Time Monte Carlo Denoising with Weight Sharing Kernel Prediction Network. And the authors are uh, Fan Hangming, Wang Rei, uh, Hou Yuqi, and Bao Hujun. And Hao Ming will uh, present the present their uh, work, and that's welcome, Hao Ming. Hi everyone, I am going to present our paper: Real Time Monte Carlo Denoising with Weight Sharing Kernel Prediction Network. Monte Carlo path tracing is a technique used to synthesize realistic images. It has the attribute of using a unified rendering pipeline to simulate various physically based visual effects. However, Monte Carlo integration usually requires thousands of samples per pixel to produce a visually noise free image. For real time applications, the computation budget of desktop GPU allows only very low samples per pixel, like one SPP configuration, which leads to the extremely noisy path traced images. Therefore, Using image-based denoising techniques to remove Monte Carlo noise would be a practical solution for production-ready applications. Monte Carlo denoising is a long-standing computer graphics research topic. Here are some examples of offline, interactive, and real-time denoising approaches. Recently, Meng proposed the Neural Bilateral Grid Denoiser, which is one of the state-of-the-art real-time denoising methods for 1SPP inputs. Image space filtering is a well-explored method for Monte Carlo denoising. It utilizes noisy path traced images and auxiliary buffers to estimate the parameters of generic nonlinear filters. Baca proposed to use the convolutional neural network to predict per pixel filtering weights. This kernel prediction method has greatly improved the image space filtering method's denoising quality. Although the filtering process is fast, the main bottleneck is predicting large kernels, which is both time consuming and memory exhausting. For example, this method requires predicting a kernel map with 441 channels for filtering size 21. One alternative speed up direction is using a hierarchical architecture to predict small sized kernels in multiple scales, which can avoid constructing a large kernel map at the full resolution. Still, the heavy unit used in this architecture blocks further exploring the speed limit of the kernel prediction method. Predicting a large kernel map in the last convolutional layer is very expensive, it takes above half of total denoising time for real-time application. Our intuition is, there exists redundant information in the large predicted kernel map. And we can explore a more compact representation of the large kernel map, to reduce the throughput of the neural networks. Then followed with a high-efficient constructor, we can construct the full rank kernel map with a negligible cost. This leads to our weight-sharing kernel prediction method which extends the basic kernel prediction method to real-time speed while maintaining its denoising quality for 1SPP inputs. In this part, I will introduce the overall architecture of our weight-sharing kernel prediction denoiser. Firstly, I will start with a pipeline without our multi-kernel configuration, and this pipeline can be divided into two phases. The main network inference overhead of basic kernel prediction method is predicting the heavy full rank kernel map. So in our first prediction phase, we instead use the network to predict a compact single-channel encoding format of the filtering weights, denoted as importance map, which has the same resolution as the input image. And then in the reconstruction phase, we use the importance map to construct the filtering kernels. Our kernel construction module includes two operations, unfolding and normalization. The unfolding operation expands the single-channel importance map to a full-rank kernel map by extracting the neighboring elements from the kernel map for each pixel. This is where our name weight sharing comes from. Then we use a channel-wise softmax function to normalize the kernel map, making the filtering kernels energy preserving. Here we construct a kernel map with a 3 by 3 filtering window size for illustration. The yellow and green color cells represent the data flow of two example positions. For the input single-channel importance map, 
we use a sliding window of size 3 to unfold it to 9 channels, and then we apply a channel-wise normalization to obtain the kernel map. Then as the final step, we filter the noisy input with a constructed filtering kernel, and remodulate the albedo to get the denoised image. This is our total two-phase pipeline without the kernel fusion module. While filtering kernels are widely varying, encoding very complex filtering information into only one single channel importance map has limitations, because the filtering weights are highly correlated for nearby pixels. To achieve a better denoise and quality, we propose the kernel fusion module, to decompose the filtering information into multiple importance maps to encode more information. We predict multiple separate importance maps, and then we construct a set of kernel maps with different filtering sizes, to independently filter the noisy image. We also predict the corresponding pixel-wise averaging weight for each importance map, used to combine the independently filtered images to get the final fused result. With the efficient kernel construction module, we can reduce the high cost of direct predicting large kernels. And with the kernel fusion scheme, we can at the same time maintain the original kernel prediction method's denoising ability. Now let's take a look at the details of each module. I will first talk about our kernel construction and kernel fusion modules denoising behaviors, and then introduce the network architecture we used. For the kernel construction module, by controlling the unfolding operations window size, we can construct specific sized filtering kernels. Here we present the denoised results using only one single constructed filtering kernel, where K refers to the kernel size. As can be seen, a small-sized filtering kernel can reconstruct sharper edges, and a large-sized kernel performs better in low-frequency regions. However, there still have some residual noise and overblur artifacts. Then in the second row, we present the denoised results with our kernel fusion module. We accumulatively add the filtering kernels from size 3 to size 13, and the number sign stands for the fused kernel count. It shows that our kernel fusion module can take advantage of the varying sized kernels with the weighted average. Here we visualize the averaging weights to intuitively check the denoising behaviors of our kernel fusion module. As shown in the second row, for high frequency regions such as the object edges, our network predicted higher averaging weights for small sized kernel filtered results. While for low frequency regions such as the broad object surfaces, our network predicted higher averaging weights for large sized kernel filtered results. This behavior is in accordance with expectation because we explicitly give the semantic meanings to our kernel fusion module specifically the varying kernel sizes, to guide the training process of our framework. Besides, we can observe that around the book edges, the averaging weights of filtering kernels with sizes 3 and 7 have high values at opposite edge sides, which means they separately reconstruct pixels in different directions, to contribute to the final denoised result when signal change happens. In summary, with the kernel fusion module and end-to-end -end training process, we can decompose the filtering information, both in frequency and in space, to multiple kernels to achieve a better denoise and quality. We have two network architectures for denoising one SPP input in real time. Our network architecture builds upon the recent work RepVGG block, which could be considered as a simple 5x5 convolutional layer here. Please refer to our paper for more information about this. The first network has six convolutional layers, and the optimized one has three convolutional layers. For both networks, we predict six importance maps and six corresponding weight maps, which is a 12-channel output. We construct a sequence of odd-sized filtering kernels to be fused from size 3 to 13. For 64 SPP inputs, we utilize a hierarchical kernel prediction architecture with three resolution levels. We predict two importance maps for each resolution level to construct filtering kernels with sizes 3 and 5. Finally, I will present the experimental results. We adopted two existing datasets from previous works. Both datasets have a resolution 1280 by 720, containing radiance, albedo, normal, depth buffers. The 1SPP dataset has 6 scenes with 60 consecutive frames for each scene, and the 64SPP dataset has 8 scenes with 100 consecutive frames for each scene. We use a holdout configuration for the training set and test set partition. We mainly compared our method to the basic kernel prediction method and its multi-resolution variant, and the recent neural bilateral grid denoiser. For KP method, we use the same network architecture as ours and directly predict full rank kernel map, whose kernel size equals the maximum fusing kernel size we used. We also included the comparisons to some relevant real-time denoising methods. We use the PSNR evaluation metric for comparison. A higher value means achieving better quality. 
We also present the denoising time ratio on the basis of our method. It shows quantitatively kernel prediction based methods KP and MRKP have better denoising quality than other denoising approaches. Our method achieves a comparable result with the kernel prediction based methods, and runs at a roughly two times faster speed. Compared with the recent real time denoiser NBGD, our method has lower quantitative errors while runs faster. The runtime performance shows that our method has about 77 FPS for 720p frames. We further divide the total denoising time to network prediction time and the reconstruction time to make a profiling. Compared with KP and MRKP, our method has fewer network prediction time costs due to the kernel construction module and the efficient fully convolutional network we used. Furthermore, compared with the recent neural bilateral grid denoiser, our method benefits from the high parallelism of kernel-based reconstruction and has less reconstruction time. So under the same time budget, we can use a deeper network to achieve better denoise and quality. Here we visualize the filtering kernel weights predicted by the basic kernel prediction method and constructed by our method. For some intuitive scenarios, we can construct filtering kernels with very similar behaviors as the directly predicted ones, such as areas around the very thin object. Another example scenario is the opposite side of the object edge. It can be seen that the kernel weights primarily concentrate on the correct side where the center pixel is located. Here we show some denoising videos for comparisons. Here we present one limitation of our method. Experimental result shows that the quality improvement grows slowly if we additionally fuse more large-sized kernels. This limitation constrains our approach from directly using very large kernels. However, it has little impact on the real-time application we aim for. To conclude, extending the kernel prediction method to prediction plus construction is a promising manner for high-quality real-time denoising. With our compact representation and scalable kernel constructor, our denoiser preserves kernel prediction methods denoising quality while roughly having its denoising time for 1 SPP inputs. In addition, compared with the recent neural bilateral grid-based real-time denoiser, our approach benefits from the high parallelism of kernel-based reconstruction and produces better denoising results at equal time. Thank you for your listening. Cool, that was an interesting presentation. Thank you. All right. Uh, again, please feel free to jump in and ask questions either in the chat room or, uh, yeah, like what Shenyo is doing, jump into the question mark box. I, I did, uh, um, go ahead. I, I, yeah, so I have basically uh, like this first question is, um, what, uh, I don't quite understand what this importance map and how it is how it translates to the kernel weights. Could you like explain it a bit more? Like, I think that's kind of a central thing in the work. Well, we um, specifically, we use the unfolding operation. That means we extract uh, the importance term from its neighbor to expand the single channel importance map to the full rank, uh, full rank, uh, full rank channel, kernel map, and uh, we then we apply the uh, channel wise channel wise normalization operation to get the final uh, kernel map. Uh, okay, so um, yes, um, so so like if you want to get a three by three map, what should the importance map be like? If you can't get three by three kernels for each pixel, what should the what you should you do with the importance 
importance maps? Uh, uh, yes, our importance map is always single channel for for any size, um, filtering size, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, the we use a specific size the sliding window. Uh, like for three by three kernel map, we use a sliding window in three by three, and uh, uh, that's that that says we direct uh, e extract the importance term from the center, uh, from the neighbors of the center pixel to mm -hmm. ex to directly expand the uh, yep. the uh, single channel importance map to the four rank okay. the four rank kernel map. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think I, I get it now. Um, so, you, so you see, you compare the work with um, like uh, MRKP, which is, uh, which has, which basically it doesn't predict different size of kernels, but predicts the same size of kernels on different scales of images, yes. right? Um, so, how like how do you compare like your your method basically has like three, five, seven, nine and so on, but like which kernel size do you choose for that method? Do you choose the single one? Like, uh, I mean, yeah, maybe it's, maybe maybe I should read the paper. Sorry, I, I maybe I should give some other people's chances to ask questions. Well, do we have other people to ask questions? If no, I can ask some questions. Uh, so, uh, so the the kernel fusion modules. I see some similarity between the kernel fusion module and the previous talk because both methods are applying the kernels multiple times to different decomposition of the image. Do, do we lose humming because uh, I don't see? Okay. Sorry for the network lag. All right, uh, I'll ask you a quick question. Uh, yeah, so I was asking oh, okay. whether, uh, so the I, I see some similarity between the kernel fusion module and the previous decompositional denoising method. Basically, both are applying these kernel prediction to uh, multiple decomposition of an image. So, so can you comment? Yes. Can you comment on like the similarity and differences between the two methods? Like, can you combine them, or they are are they doing different things or things like that? Yes, I think we share some similarities because we both use multi kernel configuration, and uh, we mostly use a multi kernel configuration for for to learn the noise characteristics uh, based on the frequency. Well, they are Compositional kernel prediction denoiser mainly uh, use the uh, use the multi kernel configuration to learn the noise characteristics based on the component. So I think we share the similarity, but uh, we used it for different uh, uh, direction. Yeah, I think the purposes are probably different. Like mm -hmm. yes. Um, yeah, the purpose and, is different, but the architectures are kind of similar. Yes. We, yeah, we so, use it to to compress the KP architecture, and they use it to extend the KP architecture. Uh, there, there's a question in the chat room. Uh, this will be our last question, uh, since uh, we'll have a social mixer. 
later. But uh, so the question is, is it difficult to, uh, the visual quality of the proposed methods show some low frequency artifacts. Is it difficult to tell if they are visually better with state of the art methods? Did you try using any perceptual metric to quantify the results? Did we lose the speaker again? So this is the fun you get with online conferencing. I'm quite happy it didn't happen for me. <laughs> yeah, uh, you're uh, so I believe Pascal has some announcement to make. Well, before that, even though Haming is not here, let's <laughs> give him some applause for the presentation. Uh, yeah, and I believe Pascal has some uh, announcement to make for the conference schedule, and I will leave here. Yes, thanks everybody. Thanks to all our speakers and all our chairs for making this a great experience today. And also huge thanks to you, the audience, for asking very nice questions and everything. Now, next up in our program today is the social mixers during which we will assign random groups of six people to chat for 10 minutes and then reassign another set of six people yet again for another 10 minutes. If you want to join in on the fun, then please head to the social hub and I will be there in a couple of minutes, explain how everything works and start the social mixers. Thanks.